standards alignment, unpacking standards, and common assessments. Uh, teachers in within professional learning uh, professional learning community model will um, use learning targets. Teachers build lessons to meet the needs of students, and they also scaffold uh, assignments and lessons and engage in differentiation. The collaborative team, that is the group of teachers who come together to, to work collaboratively and interdependent, interdependently of each other towards that common goal of student achievement, increasing student achievement, teachers having a better understanding of how students are performing. And so oftentimes under that PLC model, you will hear the term collaborative team. Common planning time, that is an expectation within the PLC or professional learning community model where our principals as they're working with their staff or um, themselves building the master schedule, there's an expectation that time would be provided during the day for teachers to come together and meet in those collaborative teams under the PLC model. And we can see the definition there for common planning time includes bringing teachers together to learn from one another and collaborate on projects that lead to improvements in lesson quality, instructional effectiveness, and student achievement. Student achievement being that uh, bottom line marker. And then professional development, there's also a PD component to a PLC model, which allows uh, teachers to engage in new learning, building new skills, and that professional development will traditionally occur outside of the common um, planning time where that collaborative team meets. When we talk about common planning time, there were five components that we wanted to share with you this evening. That includes discussing teacher work, looking at student data, looking at student work, analyzing student work, and discussing professional literature and creating courses and, and curriculum. And so these are really, uh, these terms and definitions here, that really defines the work or outlines the work that's happening in the collaborative team during that collaborative or common planning time. As teachers are discussing uh, their work, they're working collectively to review their own lesson plans and assessments that have been used in the class. And they're offering feedback and looking at ways to enhance or improve the lessons that they've previously created. Now, discussing student data, there's an expectation that the that, that teachers or that collaborative team during common planning time, that they engage in what we would call like a data dive, where we're, we're analyzing student data and getting um, more familiar in our understanding with how students are performing. And so you oftentimes uh, hear the MTSS process. We talk about multi-tiered systems of support, or you'll hear us mention that we really want to be able to support students by name and need. When we talk about supporting students by name and need, getting into those collaborative teams during that common planning time and grappling with and having discourse around uh, the student performance data, that allows us to have that better understanding of what we need to do in order to meet uh, the students by name and need. And so we talk a little bit about that there in the definitions. And then discussing student work. Teachers are able to look at student work, um, assess student work, analyze it, and make recommendations. So they're not just looking at student work as it relates to moving toward mastery of a standard, but they're also looking at it through a lens um, with how can teachers be better informed based upon the student work to make instructional shifts in their own teaching, and then be able to give students appropriate feedback. Discussing prof professional literature, teachers have opportunities to select texts, research, evidence-based practices. We want our common planning time to be a, a place and a space where uh, teachers come together as learners so they can learn from each other, um, improve their 
uh, crap and have a better, deeper understanding of what's happening in the class, what their practices um, are yielding, and, and how to be better leverage of the things that they're doing to yield greater student outcomes. And then creating courses and curriculum allows teachers to work collaboratively on lesson plans, assignments, projects, new courses, such as interdisciplinary courses taught by uh, two teachers from different subjects. And that's just an example of what, what we may see. Professional development expands one's knowledge base. And so there are some differences between um, professional development and what we would expect teachers to do during that common planning time. There are some benefits to uh, professional development. Uh, professional development usually takes place uh, once the employee has secured a position within the division and it allows them to increase their expertise specific to um, certain skills or tasks and it also um, cultivates and increases confidence and, and credibility. It increases their earning potential and higher ability and it's not we listed a couple of things here under professional development as far as types, but it, it, it can go beyond that. But we would look at seminars, webinars, conferences, workshops, volunteer events, classes and programs. And some of the benefits that we've experienced over the past number of years here in, in Falls Church City are the continuing education, earning certificates, earning a license. We're proud of our uh, partnerships with UVA, Virginia Tech, and uh, Northern Virginia. And when we talk about investing in our people over the past year, we've really doubled down on our efforts to provide uh, pathways under our professional development model for support staff to be able to take a pathway towards becoming a licensed and certified uh, teacher. We also uh, talk about the organization as far as uh, leadership development and opportunities to uh, build a pipeline for future leaders in our organization. Those are all of the things that uh, would come under professional development opportunities for our staff. Taking classes and programs and getting a higher degree. And last week we heard in our, our compensation study that the majority of our, our staff, our professional staff, teaching staff, are at that master's degree or, or above. And so, again, we want to continue to leverage our partnerships with Virginia Tech and UVA, and NOVA, and some of the other universities to be able to offer advanced degrees to our staff. When we look at professional development across the entire school calendar. Uh, we know that we do provide teachers with flexibility prior to the week of convocation. And so uh, what we mean by that is we don't mandate that teachers report to their school buildings or to CO um, that week prior to convocation to engage in division level uh, professional development. But what we do ask them uh, to do is engage in professional development um, on their own on their own time, of their own interest or curriculum area. But during the year, we do offer multiple days of division level professional development. We have four days. Three of those days are front loaded and they begin uh, during that week before the students return. And then we have two half days that we offer. And typically those days will fall, um, one will fall in uh, November or the fall time frame, and then the other in the spring. And those are, again, division-wide, um, half-day professional development where we're able to bring in all staff or work at the division, le uh, the building level on division level professional development. And then we have our early release Wednesdays, and they provide opportunities for our division level training, but they also allow us to do cross-team and cross-school uh, work as well as interdepartmental collaboration. And some of the things that we listed there are things that um, I've mentioned uh, previously around leadership development, action planning, 
and instructional planning as well as cohort work. Thank you. <laughs> so how are we using early release Wednesdays in Falls Church City? When we look at the big picture, our early release Wednesdays allow us to dedicate time to specific strategies within our school action plan. If you remember back at the beginning of the year, we had our, our principals come in and share their school action plans and, and talk specifically about the goals that they uh, aspire to, to reach with their instructional staff and, and impacts that that would have on, on their students overall. A, academic success and well-being so our early release Wednesdays allow our school principals to dig into that work uh, we also talked about investing in our people and IB infused teaching and learning and so we can provide teacher-led PD highlighting best practices aligned to to learning goals and outcomes we, uh, we we're small and we but we have phenomenal teachers and we oftentimes call upon our teachers to lead professional development and so having these early release Wednesdays allows us to um, engage our teaching staff in leading those learning opportunities for their colleagues. And then we focus our uh, work on centering around our students to meet their social emotional needs. And uh, again, social, SEL has been, which is social emotional learning, has been a topic of conversation over the past year and a half now. And so our principals have been able to double down their efforts with SEL needs. So now Ms. Amanda Davis, our JTP director of preschool, will uh, share how they are using the early release Wednesdays there. Good evening, everyone. Jesse Thackeray Preschool, we service and meet the needs of our youngest learners here in Falls Church City. Early release Wednesdays are a critical part of being able to service those students because a lot of the things that our staff needs in order to be able to service the students Monday through Friday occurs on early release Wednesdays. We conduct child find evaluations and screenings when a child comes to us either from infant toddler connection through Fairfax County or through a child find. Uh, referral, we have those meetings on early release Wednesdays. Typically those meetings can go somewhere from 30 minutes to an hour or longer, especially if it's a screening and we have all of our specialists together to meet so that we can all observe the child and best make a plan going forward. We also conduct our required trainings. Uh, on Friday, we went through an IB evaluation and those early release Wednesdays, there was time dedicated where our um, where Carrie Checa met with our teachers and to be able to prepare them for our IB evaluation that just occurred on Friday. We also have VPI meetings for a Virginia Preschool Initiative to meet uh, the needs of those students as well. And then recently we have early learning developmental standards that were um, VDOE created for preschool. And so our teachers have been attending trainings, getting to know those standards and how we can best service the needs of our students. And then we also have our early childhood special education meetings in the afternoon as well where we have our special education administrator that has time dedicated to meet with the teachers for planning purposes. We also conduct our home visits and home visits was a part of our um, school action plan for this school year. So our teachers have been using that time as well to go out into the community to meet with families in their home and best be able to come up with a plan on what you can how you can continue learning from school into the home. We also have staff meetings on that day. So we have a lot packed into that time. Our staff meetings, we're making it as robust as possible, but we also are trying to conduct child find meetings, IB and early childhood meetings as well. And in addition to that, our teachers ha use that time for teacher planning time. K to five teachers have incorporated in their schedule an encore block that is a 90 minute planning period. At JTP, we use our early release Wednesday Wednesdays for planning because the Encore block is not at JTP. Going forward, we're also going to continue to not only use our early release Wednesdays for child finds, professional development, staff meetings, and planning time, but also in addition to having responsive classroom for next school year, our pre-K teachers and K-5 to teachers will all be attending training for responsive classroom, and that will occur on Wednesdays as well. And Tim Kasich. 
Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, members of the board. Um, before I dive into how we use our early release Wednesdays at Mount Daniel, I just want to say that Thursday is Danny's birthday. And Woo-hoo! Danny has been part of Mount Daniel <laughs> since 1977. So go ahead and do the math, figure out how old Danny is. Um, so come by for some uh, purple cake if you would like. Not me. Older than me. Not me. Good for you, Amanda. (laughs) So last spring and last summer, we took a a deep dive into our master schedule to really address the need for teachers to have more common planning time. Prior to this year, our teams, and I'll speak to kindergarten in particular. So for example, there are eight sections in kindergarten. So there are eight kindergarten teachers. Prior to this year, the team was split into sub teams, the violet team and the lavender team. And they would meet in groups of four to have the discussions around what Mr. Bates was talking about earlier, all those professional learning community uh, types of questions. What do we want our children to learn? How will they know? How will we know if they learned it? What will they do if they didn't learn it? And what will we do if they already know it? That was a challenge for the team because you had four people meeting at separate times and getting them all on the same page um, was, was difficult. So they would use those Wednesday afternoons then sometimes to come together as a full team of eight. It wasn't a very efficient model. We heard them loud and clear that they wanted their common planning time to be together. So we very creatively worked collaboratively with Oak Street to create a master schedule that allowed all eight teachers Uh, from each grade level to be able to work together, to come together multiple times throughout the week to do those um, collaborative team planning uh, sessions. Um, So when when we think about the increased common planning time, it it has been asked for. And um, in my 25 years as an educator, one thing that is always very clear to me when teachers ask, or when you ask teachers, what more do you need? They always say more time. That's that's the common answer. Currently right now, the uh, early release Wednesdays are used for a variety of things. We have combined PD with Oak Street. Uh, one of the sessions or one of the topics that we discuss is school safety and security. We've worked with the police department to train our staff with the I Love You uh, response and scenario planning. Um, another um, opportunity that we had just very recently was the body percussion um, PD that we had uh, last week with. Ali Tumner. I'm not sure if anybody got to experience that, but it was a lot of fun. I've never seen the level of engagement and excitement with teachers in a room that I saw last Wednesday at Oak Street. It was it was really, really engaging. Early in the year, we worked with uh, Dr. Santiago to do some elevation training, which enhanced our um, ESOL resources and academic achievement monitoring systems for our ESOL students. And We've also, you know, done things um, operationally. For example, the compensation study presentations that have happened on uh, Wednesday afternoons are an example of how we've used um, to come together as a division or between schools to combine those Wednesday afternoons. Specifically at Mount Daniel this year, some of the things that we've tackled on uh, Wednesday afternoons, um, we rolled out the new report card this year. And that was a big lift and a big task for our teachers just to learn um, the logistics behind how to um, populate the um, the new the new report card, and to give them time to come together to work collaboratively. Like, what does a one mean? What does a two mean? What does a three mean? What does a four mean? So, for example, if Ms. Doherty is a teacher across the hall from me, and she is grading her students with a different understanding of what those those metrics mean, we could send a very confusing message to our community. We don't want to do that. We work really hard to make time for those conversations. I've been leading some responsive classroom uh, morning meeting activity demonstrations this year um, that is to enhance our social emotional learning. Um, And I'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, We've also taken a pretty deep dive into our advanced academics and how to engage all of our students and differentiate up all of our students deserve that opportunity to uh, be stretched and to you know, have creative thinking opportunities. So we've worked with the CIA team to plan opportunities for our staffs to come together and, and incorporate more into their daily lesson plans. Our master schedule team continues to meet while we made some pretty significant enhancements to our master schedule this year. They're constantly meeting um, about once a month 
to go over any challenges or what tweaks might be made or considered for next year and the years moving forward. Um, taking a look at challenges, we're surveying our staff all the time, getting their input, getting their feedback, and they're constantly making considerations and going back and looking at the schedule. That is a cross section of staff members who don't have time during the school day. They don't have that common planning time. You have kindergarten teachers, first grade teachers, second grade teachers, specialists and the like who don't have that time together during the school day. We have a different type of grade level team meetings that happen on Wednesday afternoons as well. Uh, Mr. Bates described kind of that academic collaborative planning time around students um, achievement data and data analysis. But the team meetings that happen on Wednesday afternoons are more for like the logistics of the team. Um, how, who's planning the um, field trip? Who's creating the permission slip? Who's making sure it gets run? All those operations and logistics things that you don't have time for during the academic meetings. My special education team is more than 20 adults. Uh, when you consider the teachers, paras, related service providers, and other specialists uh, that provide our services to our students with special needs, they do not have common planning time during the week. The only time they have to come together, and I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice, I'm fighting a cold. The only time they truly have to come together is on those Wednesday afternoons. Our special education paras have received professional learning uh, in the area of IEP basics and um, applied behavior analysis basics for paraprofessionals. Um, our paras do so much work. They are hands on with our kids. They are the front line. So giving them the professional learning that they need on those Wednesday afternoons has been really crucial to help meet the needs of our students. The case managers and paras are given time to collaborate on Wednesday afternoons uh, because our parents have a contract that is limited um, and they don't have time during the day because as soon as the students arrive, all students arrive, we hit the ground running, literally. Mm -hmm. If you've been to Mount Daniel, you see me in my sneakers because <laughs> I'm literally running. Um, another component of our Wednesday afternoons that we use is our um, curriculum team leaders are receiving professional development. And these are the folks that really move that instructional piece forward um, they're getting training and meeting facilitation, um, like adaptive schools, meeting planning strategies and, and the like. This is also the time for me to have my leadership team meetings. Again, it's a cross section of the staff. I have uh, teachers and representatives from all over the building and to be able to come together to monitor our school action plan, share and disseminate information, long-term planning and summer school planning and resource deployment, um, and setting and monitoring the vision and mission of Mount Daniel um, are some of the ways that we currently use our Monday afternoons, or I'm sorry, Wednesday afternoons. In thinking of the years to come, a couple of big initiatives that we have coming up is more enhanced responsive classroom training. Um, and responsive classroom, you hear us say it a lot, but the definition from the website is um, an evidence-based approach to teaching and discipline that focuses on engaging academics, positive community, effective management, and developmental awareness. These professional development books and resources help elementary and middle school educators create safe, joyful, and engaging classrooms in school communities. And it's not a one and done type of professional learning. It is the very best professional learning that I got to experience as a teacher. Um, and it's an intense four days uh, for round one. And then it continues as you go. And, the library books that I still pull off my shelf daily to help support teachers and students um, is, has been so beneficial. And I'm very excited that we have the opportunity that you've all made the investment to give us that opportunity with our teachers and staff. And then finally, um, we're having new reading standards that are being introduced uh, by the VDOE. And those new uh, reading standards are gonna come with evidence-based curriculum um, that's gonna be adopted for the 24-25 school year. So we're gonna need professional learning for all staff um, in order to implement the new curriculum with fidelity. Um, so thank you for giving me the time to kind of talk about and illustrate how we use our time um, and, and why we just feel it's, it's important, but to engage in this discussion and this conversation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kasich just did such a wonderful job explaining so much of what we already do. 
Uh, can you hear me? Sorry, I thought you said no. Um, I would also add that division-wide leader uh, professional development also happens on these early release Wednesdays. For instance, um, Dr. Santiago, um, our director of equity, she is required. We are required to participate in two hour, two hours of cultural proficiency, proficiency training, every staff member in the division. And uh, this particular training, in order to be done correctly, effectively, uh, appropriately, it must be in groups that are no larger than 20. And so that's uh, what a lot of our early release Wednesdays have been used for across the division, is that Dr. Santiago will use um, a location around the division to be able to offer up various opportunities uh, for staff members to sign up 20 at a time. So that's one piece. Uh, he said so many of the other things that we use our early release Wednesdays for our CTLs or our um, uh, collaborative team leaders when they receive this leadership training. It's, it's another combined professional development uh, that is uh, provided by our CIA team. And it's incredibly supportive. They're growing a lot. They're getting a lot of input in that. Um, we're also um, in terms of the changes to the reading standards, we're also really changing around Virginia. If you've heard the science of reading, that's been a big thing. In fact, that's why it's really exciting that at Mount Daniel, feel better, at Mount Daniel, um, all our teachers have gotten trained in Orton Gillingham, which is huge. I, I really don't know of another division, well, maybe one. I think I've only know of one other division because I hired a teacher from there that um, takes the, makes that investment to pay for primary teachers to be trained in Norton Gillingham, which is an incredibly strong um, reading program. Uh, the science of reading is going to impact how third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers also teach reading. Um, it really started at the primary level over the last two years uh, where our children are learning to read. And then, of course, when they get to three, four, five, they're reading to learn. So um, our upper grade teachers will be um, experiencing some new professional development in those areas as well. In turn, as well as the changes in the reading standards and any new um, evidence-based programming that we use. We had to wait for a year while uh, VDOE decided which ones they would approve of for schools to adopt. Um, so that is part of it. But as I shared with you a while back, I'm really excited about the Early Release Wednesdays and additional professional development coming to Oak Street next year. Uh, one Wednesday a month, our entire staff will concentrate on IB infused instruction. Um, some of our teachers have been doing it for a while and they're incredibly gifted at embedding um, the international baccalaureate um, expectations. And so we want to make sure that it's really strong across the board, uh, whether they've been teaching at Oak Street 15 years or, you know, uh, two, two years, one year. And uh, so that will be one Wednesday a month, every uh, single month. And then the other Wednesday, an additional Wednesday a month, we're going to have really academic choice for our teachers. Because when you own, when you have some choice in your professional development, that's when you grow the most. So we're going to have advanced academics, um, professional development for that cohort of nine teachers next year. We're also going to have special education, professional development. We're going to have specific professional development once a month for our paraprofessionals. We really are fortunate that we have a strong uh, special education program and that we're uh, well resourced, but it's so important to hold on to these great resources and to continue developing them as they work with our children. So I'm really excited about having one Wednesday a month that's dedicated to that, where our paraprofessionals will get that professional development. And also, our special education team will get to meet. As Tim shared, our special education teachers are supporting students across all three grade levels, so they never have one block of time that's common to them except those early release Wednesdays. So one Wednesday a month, we're going to meet together with a special education administrator. We're gonna develop their own craftsmanship, but we're also going to take that time um, to really develop um, consistencies in how we do things. You know, some case managers 
really know how to bring in a parent perspective and voice into the room, we want to make sure that every single case manager has that same level of gift. Um, and that happens through that ongoing professional development, um, just creating a, a consistencies of practice, opportunities to troubleshoot together so that we're constantly getting minds together on how best to support our students and teachers when we're co-teaching with them. So that's going to be a wonderful opportunity set aside once a month. I'm also really excited because we're going to have book studies. We're going to have book studies both in math and in language arts. So uh, for language arts, our literacy coach is looking through um, all sorts of great books. She was trying to choose between um, two science or reading books. She's like, this one's really good, but it's a little dry. This one's really good and it's a little bit more engaging. So we're going to look, we're going to purchase um, um, four different books, 10 books of each of the four so that we'll have two book study opportunities the first semester and two book study opportunities uh, the second uh, semester. And so I'm excited about that. Of course, I want to participate in each one. Uh, we're also going to have um, our um, math professional development available as well. And so one of the 45 minute blocks will be, I know I'm saying a lot more than what's on the slide, but it wouldn't have fit in the slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, one of the 45 minute blocks will be about a rich math task, rigorous math task. And then the other 45 minute block will be, and I might get this wrong, making, uh, building thinking classrooms. And, um, and so Jen Fessenden, um, she has already done so, uh, led the building um, thinking classrooms at the secondary level. And so I'm really excited to have her be able to um, be available, be invited because she's available. She makes herself avail available. Be invited to Oak Street once a month during uh, one early release Wednesday a month where she will be able to lead uh, one of the book talks uh, for teachers um, to talk about building thinking classrooms. We also are going to offer up ongoing uh, social emotional learning opportunities. Um, one of the things I've talked about at our principal copies is the zones of regulation that we're going to implement as part of our tier one where our counselors will teach zones of regulation to every single class three through uh, five and then we're also going to offer parent training and sharing so that we're all um, using the same language at home and at school with our students and so you'll be invited to a principal coffee next year where you'll get your own color uh, poster that you can put on your refrigerator or wherever you like so that our students are able to really when they're a little too frustrated maybe to exactly share in language they can use that color and say this is how I'm feeling right now and then you can go to okay what kind of strategies do you have available that you can use right now um, so we want to make sure our teachers are all trained in that as well. Even though our counselors will be teaching our students, we want to make sure our grade level teachers are also experienced with the language. So that will be one of the professional development opportunities that will be offered periodically once a month. And also trauma-informed classrooms is another piece. Um, and um, a responsive classroom is another one. So we want to just make sure that we have this amazing menu of professional development opportunities offered once a month on Wednesdays where teachers have some say in what they want to learn from. They can also take turns. They might decide that part of their team is going to go to these trainings right here. Part of the team will go over here and then they can bring it all to their collaborative planning um, during the week. So we're excited about that Wednesday. And then of course the other Wednesday where we will all come together and uh, be able to really um, build up our IB instruction. Another piece I want to make sure to share is also that currently in the future as well, our Encore Specialist, um, well, they're the ones teaching all the classes at the same time that the teachers are able to have that common planning time. So those early release Wednesdays are when they're able to come together with our PYP leaders and um, our IB coordinator and they check in on a quarterly basis to be able to have that vertical articulation um, about how PYP is being embedded throughout our Encore classes. So we're going to be really busy, but we're really excited about it. So thank you. Hello, everybody. And I think Rob and Dave are behind me. So I'm going to ask if you all want to grab this other mic to chime in too. Um, we're a little different in that we only have um, one 
early release per month. Um, so for us, it's really important that we're super strategic with the amount of time we get because it is limited. Um, so one of the things we do um, as a leadership team to start the, the year, actually it's in the summer, we sit down with our action plan um, from the prior year because they are multi-year plans and we look at what are our goals and then how are we gonna utilize that early release time to make sure we're meeting those needs and providing that time for teachers to do the work needed to support the goals that we've, we've created together. So that's sort of the beginning of how the process works. And then we really look at how we align those blocks of time to map it out for the year. Um, and it always starts off so pretty. <laughs> with the best laid plans and we're like, oh, by the end of the year, we'll have it all done. It'll be perfect, right? And then comes a shift in how we're gonna do lockdown drills and we need to eke in time for the budget and here comes a mandatory training for the state, right? So that time every year just gets gobbled up, but we really do try to stay true to keeping um, some of the foundational things you see here, but just to kind of operationalize it a little bit, William started off to talk a little bit about how we use our edge of speak, which is true, um, but the common planning time at the middle school that is built into this teacher's daily planning time is by team. So it's by sixth grade team, seventh grade team, eighth grade team, and encore. So all of those teacher teams get planning time together. The way it's built at middle school is centered around students, right? So those students, in theory, matriculate by grade level with the same cluster groups of teachers, and thereby those teachers have the same planning time to be able to talk about students. It's harder to do um, these days because we do have a lot of teachers that teach off of specific teams. So that's one of the things that we're sort of wrestling with as we keep a master schedule together is how do we keep the integrity of those team student conversations together? So when you build it by team, what it means you don't have is time to meet by curricular department. So the math department, the science department, right? So Wednesdays becomes the time that we really give them to meet by department. Not only is it the time that the middle school can meet by department, it becomes the time we can meet vertically because we're all off. So as we've tried to become better in aligning our MYP practices that span 610, and actually as we align our language for our approaches to teaching and learning that spans 612, that time becomes sort of mission critical, right? That we go across campus. Um, for the high school, their common planning time is scheduled around department. So it is by curricular group. What does that sacrifice? The ability to have time to talk about students. So then early release time becomes critical because we need counselors, special educators, ESOL teachers, the specialists who don't have that common time built in to also be accessible. So it's sort of two different groups, but that early release time solves the problem to be able to bring everyone together. So it really does become mission critical. The other piece that William talked about was the professional development. We know right now it's more paramount than ever that we give our teachers an opportunity to get that new learning, to engage in learning from others, and to have the space and time to reflect. And I think, Kareem, you mentioned this too, to implement. We throw a lot at them with new learning, and we don't give them time to digest it, to unpack it, to reflect on it, but then more importantly, to implement it and then come back to it to say it worked or it didn't work. We just keep going. And early release time, when we've given them that efficacy to take it on and build it themselves, they come back and say, this was good. We had the opportunity to do this. I think for us, the most powerful early release we had was one at the start of the year, where we sat down and we watched them for the first time in a long time come together as a campus and really dig into goals that they wanted to write 612. And we were like, okay, it's two o'clock. Let's, you guys can go to your next, your next session. They didn't leave. And it was the first time that we said, oh my gosh, just like, like don't say anything, let them stay. Because they hadn't had it in so long, just give them that time. And so for us, it does become sort of mission critical to getting the actual needs of the work done. 
Some of the things we've listed here on the slide, though, um, just for your own knowledge, we do um, have some departments that are cross campus. So our CTE department, we have teachers that teach in two schools, um, our language acquisition and our mathematics department. So this becomes the only time that they have to be able to meet as an entire campus. Um, to the best of our ability, Matt Sowers does everything he can to try to get our language acquisition teachers off at the same time. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't, we need early release Wednesdays. Um, so that, that again becomes mission critical. I think on the next slide, Dave and Rob, please chime in here. We've had to use a lot of this for operational needs this year, specifically as we've talked about drills and other conversations that relates to budget and scheduling. Did you want to add anything? I mean, I don't know if I can say it any better than you, Valerie, but <laughs> um, I will say when Valerie, when Valerie says this is when our departments meet, it literally is like our short Wednesdays are booked from 12 to three. Our kids walk out at 1210 and our teachers are in meetings right away. It is every single Wednesday. They are booked from 1210 to three. Um, and the only thing that I would say kind of looking forward is that I think everyone in this room recognizes that our kids are different post COVID. Um, and this would be from a secondary campus lens. This would be the chance for us to teach our teachers how to address those needs. Um, these are things that we've heard from our teachers all year. It's like I need tools in my tool belt yes. on how to address the needs of the kids sitting in front of me. Um, and we have heard that we have taken that in. We've done all of our teacher check ins to hear that consistently. And I think as we look forward to next year and the years forward, um, we have to address um, kind of, you know, the trauma and what has what has come off of off of COVID and that learning disruption. So that would be kind of my thought um, looking forward. But I think from a middle school lens, just please know that our, our short Wednesdays are packed. Um, and it was one of those trade offs with our instructional leadership team that if we go with a master schedule that is team based, then they get those short Wednesdays to really dig into some of that department work. So that's from a middle school lens. And here's Dave. Uh, I would just add that without, you heard Valerie say we can plan this and we have more than enough things that teachers are ready or engaged in. But what we can't plan for is all the things that pop up and the time becomes invaluable because more often than not, you know, it's, it's that time for us to work on the operational piece or we, you know, whatever it is that happens to be, you know, the, the piece of the moment where we have actual time to bring everybody together. So it's super useful time for all of us. And I think the last thing I'd offer that has not been shared today, it actually is the only time that we have dedicated to support our new teachers. Mm. And, and, I, and I don't want that to get lost because our new teachers, um, I think, come here and they come here for all the right reasons. And we have a great layer of support with our CIA team and the mentoring work that Sally Larish does to match them with mentors in the building. Um, and this actually becomes the only time that we can actually pull them together to sit down and offer them some face time and support as a cohort. Um, and so I, I do worry about not being able to offer that because it's very hard to enter this profession as is um, and to not be able to have this time where they can do this unencumbered, not after school, not on a like sacrificing time that they would see as their instructional planning time. Um, I do worry about that um, as we continue to try to build up our newest professionals. So, um, and that Valerie, is it for me. Can I jump in real quick? Yes, please. To, to echo Valerie, there's another group of people that um, this is the only time that they get to collaborate and that's our support staff. Um, our support staff clock out at 315 and our short, Wednesdays, our short Wednesdays are the only time that they can get any sort of training um, on contract hours. So that's when they would do their CPI training. That's where they would do their uh, Virginia IEP training. Um, and so every short Wednesday, we have our paras um, and our support staff in a training session because that is the only time that they are able to contractually. So I just wanted to add that in as another group of people that, um, that that's their time too. And thank you. Thanks. So on this next slide here, we listed all of the early release days that we have. And I'm not going to say early release Wednesdays because at the very bottom, you see there's there are some additional days on the, the middle school and high school side that are set for um, exams. But we listed uh, by date and month all of the early release days for our elementary and elementary schools in JTP, which that includes 27 days. And then on the secondary side, we have 14 days listed there by month and date. Uh, but again, noting that 
we have four days for uh, final exams and then the 7th of June is that last day or um, an early release day. So, uh, just, I'm sorry, no, just, okay. just one more note I, I failed to mention at the very bottom there, we did include the, um, the dismissal times. And so you have the early release dismissal time for JTP and for our elementary schools at 1240 p.m. and 115 p.m. and then the regular release time for JTP which is 220 p.m. and our elementary schools which is 350 p.m. and then next to that we have our secondary campus early release at 1210 p.m. and the regular release time at 3 p.m. we wanted to note that as well so you could actually see the times on paper. So thank you, William. Um, Falls Church City Public Schools is the only school division in the surrounding area um, that has an early release um, day each week. Um, but as William just went over with the calendar, um, in any weeks that we have a holiday or a day that students aren't in session, there's not an early release that week. And when we look at the other school divisions that have moved away from early release days, um, whatever day of the week that was, as Dr. Noonan indicated, those school divisions typically added days throughout the calendar for professional development. Our early release days are counting as a full school day and our 180 days of school. Um, but if we were to put days in the calendar specifically for professional development, they wouldn't count towards those 180 days of school. So typically what you see in those other school divisions is the end of school is later as a result of adding those non-student days throughout the year. And when we look at the elementary calendar, and I'll focus on elementary here, it's 2.58 hours um, less than a standard instructional day. But when you look at our instructional days overall, our days are actually longer than the surrounding school divisions, right? And I believe that that was designed to help make up some of that time from Wednesday. So when you look at that additional time, our standard day at the elementary level is six hours and 40 minutes. And when we compare that to Arlington is at six hours and 30 minutes and Fairfax and Loudoun are both at six hours and 25 minutes. So when you add that up over the year, Right, that really does make up for nearly all of that early release time in terms of that instructional day. And I didn't include it on the slide, but you see the same thing happen at the secondary level as well. Um, our days are slightly longer, right, designed to make up that instructional time from the early release days. So when we look at our staff, um, as I indicated before, our teaching staff and our paraprofessionals are on seven and a half hour day contracts. So on Wednesdays, even though students leave early, those staff are there. Um, and are using that time for all the things that the principals just covered with us. When we look at substitute teachers, our staff, um, teaching staff, when they take leave, our system allows them to enter the full day of leave for themselves. But if they need a substitute for a shorter period of time, they can just ask for the sub for that shorter period of time. So that's currently what happens on Wednesdays. So on Wednesdays, um, when there's an early release, they're hiring subs based on the hour. So I did just a really kind of rough order of magnitude calculation here. This is certainly not completely thought through. I didn't go through and break down how many subs were for elementary, how many subs were for secondary. But what I did is I looked at Wednesdays from the beginning of the school year through March. And I said, on average, we see 22 subs used for each of those days. So if we assumed that on those days we would get a sub for a full day instead of a partial day, it's about $1,000 a day. So that's kind of that rough order of magnitude, right? Many teachers, um, if they need to have an appointment of some type, whether it be doctor, dentist, right? If they do that on a Wednesday afternoon, perhaps they'll just need to miss a little bit of some other activity versus missing instructional time with students. Um, so if we were to eliminate early release Wednesdays, the impact could shift, right? Depending on um, how leave plays out and how much that would change what people do. Um, currently, our Rec and Parks program is offering an early release Wednesday camp at Mount Daniel. They've hired part-time hourly staff to provide that program. So in the event that that program wasn't needed, they would just not use those hourly staff. Um, so I don't believe that that would have a revenue impact to them. And when we look at our daycare program, any change that we would make in Wednesdays or the schedule would also impact daycare, depending on what we did. So then the last slide, I believe, had all of the questions from the school board, and the slide indicates on what slide we believe that information was provided. So thank you for giving all of us an opportunity 
have to go through this information and we look forward to questions. So we'll, we'll wrap up um, just to say, um, first of all, again, thanks to our principals for coming out for another night. I think one of the things um, we, we hope you heard through this is um, what's important to us is the time, right? It's the time for professional development, professional learning. Um, you know, time is a, in some ways a constant in schools because we start the day at eight o'clock and we end the day at three o'clock and we go five days a week and there's not a lot of flexibility with the number of days, but there's always flexibility with how we use those days. So, um, so we don't have any solutions. Um, we, we just have information, but we wanted to make sure that the board knew that the time is really important to us. And hopefully you heard through the conversations tonight um, uh, about the value that that time, that time brings. So um, with that, I, I think uh, our staff would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Noonan and uh, Mr. Bates and Ms. Michael and, and the principals who are with us this evening. Uh, any questions from or comments from this board? Yes, Ms. Silverman. Thank you, Dr. Noonan, Mr. Bates, and to all the principals who are here to discuss this important issue. Um, I just want to first start with, you know, being the daughter of a public school teacher, I grew up understanding the need for time in schools. And so that's not something I take lightly, and it's something that I saw growing up, and I helped grade, help grade papers for my mother once I got to an, a grade level old enough to do so. And um, I, I definitely understand the pressures that are on teachers. And I more than anything, I want the most important thing that we're discussing here is our children's education, right? That's number one. And in order to do that, we need quality teachers. And in order to have quality teachers, we need teachers that have time for planning and prepping and professional development and everything else that goes into it. Um, but I am happy that we are having this conversation. Um, and I, so I share if I can have a bunch of questions unless anyone wants, I can pause for a moment and see if anyone wants to interject at all. You go ahead. And, okay. Yeah. Um, Dr. Noonan, I know a few months ago when I first brought this topic up, we had, I brought up, I, I wanted to try to find a compromise. And, and I'm all about trying to find a compromise, something that works well for the teachers and staff and administrators, and also something that works for the families and, the, and again, most importantly, the kids. And one thing that I had asked was about just moving early release Wednesdays to early release Fridays. Um, that does alleviate some of the, uh, to me, there's two issues here. There's children in the in the classroom and the, and the seat time that they get um, and then to a lesser extent there's also the juggle that parents have um, if they're if it's a two income household especially and if they're both working but you know most importantly the seat time that children have um, but moving it to Fridays wouldn't it really address the seat time but it does address that secondary issue which is the parents juggling um, so just wanted to hear your response again on moving it to Fridays instead sure um well, let me, let me just say this about the seat time first. And I think that was um, the point that I think Kristen Michael was trying to make was that our days are longer on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And that cumulative time over the course of the year makes up for that seat time on those Wednesdays. So we are um, completely aligned with everyone else with respect to, to seat time around us. So um, putting back uh, uh, putting back the half day Wednesdays to become full time Wednesdays would actually extend our seat time even more than um, surrounding jurisdictions. And I, I'm not suggesting that's a bad thing or a good thing. It just is, um, and and the potential. Um, or it could be positive, I think the, the question would be, again, sort of where does that professional development come from? But in terms of the movement of, of half-day Wednesdays to moving to Fridays or even moving to Mondays, I think, I think the general concern um, that, that I would have, and, and we probably would need to engage more deeply with um, like our SAOs and some PTAs and some other, other folks around it, would be, uh, and, and even with our um, FCCEA, is, um, would, would those be as valuable uh, because they're tied to a weekend? The, the concern that we have currently is we do have staff that take off Fridays and Mondays already. And if we were to shorten those Fridays to half days, for example, um, I worry generally that they would become less important or be seen as days that could just be taken off. Um, obviously, we control the leave of people. Um, and we don't have to grant leave on Mondays and Fridays. In fact, we're starting to tighten down a little bit on some of that already. 
um, and and without some sort of you know doctor's note or something like that, you would have to be here for Friday or Monday. So, um, so there are some measures we could put in to make it more complicated for people. Um, but at the same time, you know, you get people that are there that don't want to be there. Sometimes it's a challenge. So the best analogy I can make, if you'll indulge me for a second, is, um, you know, we have uh, Mustang Block at the high school, just as an example, or, or Flex or Pack at the, at the middle school. And those don't happen at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day. Because if Husky Flex or Pack or, or Mustang Block happened at the beginning of the day, kids would just like sleep in and say, oh, it's not that important. I don't need to go. Um, if it was at the end of the day, parents would say, I'll just pick you up for your appointment early because you're just going to miss the Husky Flex, right? So I, I really feel like if we were to add a half day to a Friday, parents might be more inclined to say, oh, it's just a half day Friday. Let's just take a three-day weekend and not worry about it. That, to me, would be the antithesis of what we're trying to accomplish, which is to uh, make sure that our kids are in school. So I would just worry about that generally. It's a long answer to your question. I'm sorry. But no, that's okay. And um, you're more concerned about the families and, and families and staff. Okay. You know, so I get to, you know, in response to that, I start thinking, but if all of this professional development is so crucial, mm -hmm. would they miss it? You know, I, I mean, I, I kind of feel like you can't have it both ways. You can't say, oh, well, it's so crucial. We absolutely need it. And at the same time, if it's moved to Fridays, we're just going to blow it off anyway. I, I understand. I, we also work in a human organization, and, and humans make interesting decisions sometimes. Um, I, I think everyone up here would say if we have to adopt a new literacy program at the elementary school and every teacher needs to be trained, they should be there for that no matter what. Um, and, and our staff... Uh, might schedule a doctor's appointment on a Friday because it's just easier to miss a half day than it is to miss a, a full day with kids. So I just worry. I understand your point, though. I, I do. And uh, I don't think we're trying to have it both ways. We're just we're trying to be realistic. <laughs> May I jump in and um, to piggyback off of a change? Typically, if we're using uh, a provide an outside provider to come in and do PD, a lot of those will happen at the beginning of the week on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Might be rescheduled to a Thursday, but not typically happen on a Friday. And a lot, and also when our staff has professional development during the middle of the week, they also can use that as planning time to be able to implement some of those new initiatives on a Thursday and Friday to see how they would work in their schedule versus it being on a Friday and having that time on an early release Wednesday to be able to implement those new initiatives on the Thursday and Friday gives them that additional instructional time to especially for our younger students to see if it'll work because change is not is kind of not a, a hard uh, easy thing for them but trying it out for a couple of days and being able to have the weekend to kind of plan and reflect and adjust for how next week's uh, instructional plan is going to go Wednesdays work best for us. But, but nothing's off the table, Ms. Silverman. I, I think part of the reason we're having this conversation is because, you know, if, if it is the will of the board to, to do away with half-day Wednesdays or look at a different day, I think we could we can, you know, get creative. We just don't want to lose the time for professional development, professional learning. Absolutely. Um, if anyone else <coughs> wants to cut me off for a moment, I'm go happy ahead, to. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go. Oh, oh, Dr. Ortiz. I have one kind of question for staff, and maybe it would probably be best if you thought about this and 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 brought it back or, or sent it through Dr. Noonan. You can send it to us in a Noonan's notes. But it seems like there's kind of two pieces of the way that early release Wednesdays work. Um, uh, and, and I think it's exemplified by the fact that, that Ms. Hardy was the one who kind of closed everything out, is that there's the monthly one, which is, you know, kind of like, I don't know, like a big, bigger one where, you know, there's a bigger initiative that's being trained on or something like that. And I was trying to make a chart of what they were at the various schools. And then there's the just coordination that has to occur more regularly. And especially it seems that between um, Oak Street and Mount Daniel, there's, it's really essential that that happens more regularly. So I think, you know, even if there were, you know, magically 200, 370 days in a year, and we could just add five more days and not worry about it, um, it seems like, even if we can make up all those hours, that there's something there that's missing, especially in that regular coordination at the for the younger learners. And I think that's something that I'd like to know what is really special about that time that is different than, okay, we need to get everybody trained on this reading program. We'll do that over the, you know, 
once a month over the next few months, you know. And I think so that's kind of the question I have is what's the difference between the kinds of coordination that occurs, you know, regularly versus the periodic training that occurs? That's a great question. Um, but actually, I want to touch on the reading, though, because last year, uh, because my school was a pre-K-5, I did go through the science of learning training, and it was a lot. Um, it was really good training, but good training needs to be implemented right away. And um, as we all know as learners, when you just kind of do it maybe five different times a year, that might not fall on the five different times a year that you're able to come back, bring it back immediately into the classroom and problem solve with that. Um, some of the additional coordination that you spoke to is that Mount Daniel and Oak Street share three, actually we share two coaches and then all three of us, JTP, Mount Daniel and Oak Street share the PYP coach. Um, so Carrie Cheka is our PYP coach who supports JTP, Mount Daniel and Oak Street. That's a great deal of coordination right there. Um, in fact, just last week, mm -hmm. uh, JTP had uh, their PYP visit and our coordination was such that I was subbing in one of the classrooms. <laughs> Oh, I love three, four, five. <laughs> they kind of wore me out. Uh, they were cute, though. <laughs> grades grades three, cute. four, five. You love I grades. love grades three, four, five. Um, but so that's part of the coordination, too, is that ongoing professional development, implementation, and planning through uh, the lens of the PYP with uh, Carrie Cheka. And then for language arts, that ongoing uh, vertical learning that happens by sharing that same uh, literacy coach and the math coach. Uh, my hope is that um, as, as next year will be my second year working uh, with uh, Tim Kasich is that on, um, on those Wednesdays where we'll have a variety of choice that some of those will be wonderful opportunities where we can also continue to have some of those com combined PD opportunities since we do share the same coaches. Um, so there, you're absolutely right. There's just so much more coordination that needs to happen and, and ongoing. Um, if you just put maybe, you know, one day a month, um, then it takes what you know 25 days if you don't count the weekend something like that to i did the math all wrong there and i know <laughs> and um it, it it takes all that more all that time to implement and then all that lag time before you can come back together and say i tried this how did that work for you what else can i do uh, so just that ongoing opportunity to dialogue to implement to come back is is so important um and uh just even thinking with the math and the rigorous tasks um, in the past, when I had my staff um, do uh, the by uh, Monday, every other Monday was professional development for us. And um, when we were looking at those rigorous tasks, it was really meaningful to be able to have more times to really look at it and look at, this is what we're currently planning and teaching during our, C, uh, this is what we're planning during our CT meetings. And now let's really look at, this is the concept that we're teaching in math right now. Let's really dig in and create a really rich math task around the concept that we're teaching. So it really is linked to what's happening during that time period. Um, and of course, that's really happening in the early years with uh, K through five and having that connection. Thank you for that question. I could talk about it some more with you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. We just going back to Ms. Silverman. Anyone else want to jump in? Okay. Um, another, I'm, I'm again trying to be creative so that we can figure out a way to make this work. Um, this is not trying to pit communities together against each other or, you know, try to el eliminate something that's necessary in the schools for, you know, to benefit one side and not the other. I'm just trying to be creative here. What are the thoughts on, um, you know, going, we're, we're basically at three times a month if there's 27 early release days in the elementary school. So in practicality, because of the weeks where there's a holiday or we're closed for some reason, that's a full Wednesday. So it's basically three times a week, three times a month. Um, going down to once a month and shortening the day um, or eliminating and then shortening the day even more, um, basically to align with the rest of our, our neighbor, neighboring counties. Is that a possibility? Uh, if we were to do what our neighboring counties would do by eliminating for example, the half days, 
we would want to add back five or six days for professional development because that's what they've done. Um, and that's always a possibility, right? Um, but if we do add back five days, um, you know, it, it would mean we'd have to find those five days somewhere in the school year. And those, those full days don't count as school days where the half days do count as school days. And that's an important distinction because if we have a full day of professional development, which would be great, it ex for every day we put in, it extends the school year one more day. So you all recently passed a policy on, on the calendar, and if we were to add five or six days for PD, we might be out of compliance with the school board policy. Um, in terms of shortening the day, um, if we were to look at that as an option, we would have to do some math to, to figure it out. But let's say we shorten each day by 25 minutes. That 25 minute chunk of time doesn't give us the bang for the buck that we would get with a two and a half hour chunk of time together. Um, so it's so while you may have these blocks of time five days a week that are part of the contracted time where teachers aren't teaching anymore because they the students have been released early or like instead of four or three forty five they got out at three fifteen that half an hour chunk five days a week just doesn't have the same impact or effect as the two and a half hours together. Um, so I think, you know, again, I think there are lots of solutions that we could look at. I think the, I think the advocacy that I hear come through from the principals and from our staff are making sure that we have the chunks of time to be able to, to do that professional development. Um, you, you know, we, I, I did do a quick back at the napkin um, look at the slide that um, showed the, the days and you're right on average It's actually less than three days a month when you take into account um, August and June uh, And you put those together as like one month and call it two days um, So you take those numbers divided by ten months as opposed to um, what's there and it, it's really two about 2.7 um, days per month, so um, I don't, I don't any, again, anything's possible. It's just a matter of trade-offs at the end of the day. And, um, it, you know, the, again, the one thing I don't want to, I don't want to trade off is our opportunities for our staff to be learning. Because when our staff is learning, our kids are learning. So on that note, I, I did add up, and I, and I know I shared you with my math on this. Um, I did add up our professional development days compared to Arlington's. Um, and if you count each early release Wednesday as a half day of professional development. We have um, our elementary, it, our, our professional development plus teacher work days plus early release, each one counting as a half day, comes out to 19 and a half days per school year. And that does not count the August days because Arlington didn't publicize their August professional development days. So I, I didn't know how to make a comparison. So we currently have about double what Arlington currently has. Um, so, you know, maybe the choice isn't eliminating early release Wednesdays because I understand that each half day counts as a day of school uh, as part of the 180 that we need to meet. But going down to once a month, um, you know, is the way to go. And that actually wouldn't necessitate adding any professional development days because it would still align with what other school districts are doing. Um, and so there, there's that issue. And then I guess on a, kind of a broader framework, you know, something bigger that I'm thinking about is, you know, every other school is school district is able to, you know, to, to have quality schools. Um, I, I don't know why we're different and why we can't also be high quality. Um, at, and at the same time, having more full, you know, fuller Wednesdays, whether it's um, just one early release Wednesday a month or zero. So those are just two issues that I've been thinking about. Thank you. It, would it be okay if I just shared a little bit, only because um, you did compare it to other divisions and I just came from one. And, um, and uh, it's been hard 
since uh, Fairfax dropped the Mondays. And what ended up happening was that those additional days that were added uh, for professional development weren't sufficient. Uh, some of it had to do with consultants and when they could come. And what ended up happening was really kind of a nightmare when it comes to substitute teaching because some of the professional development had to occur during the week. And so we would hire uh, substitutes and say, okay, you know, let's say this grade level is going to get trained, let's say, in Orton Gillingham. And okay, that's great. We got the money, we've got the sub uh, coverage, and we're going to do all this. And then all of a sudden, subs would call out, and it was this hoopla. And as you know, sub coverage has really become an issue across the board. It currently is for us. Uh, that was actually a surprise. Uh, for me that it, it's an issue here too. <laughs> I thought maybe it was just uh, their, them problem. And uh, so that was something that we did face. The other thing that we had to do was um, um, my past uh, staff had to come in early uh, four times a month in order to um, continue to do the professional development that was required because those days just weren't uh, sufficient because they easily get taken up with uh, what VDOE comes up with. VDOE makes changes after the school year has started. Um, so even if you have days in advance in August and you're like, all right, we're going to do it all there. We're going to get our teachers uh, trained. All of a sudden, VDOE doesn't come up with the changes until after the school year has begun. Um, so there, there were a lot of other impacts. There also um, teacher retention rates in Falls Church are really pretty great and um, they, um, they have continued to go down in neighboring divisions like Arlington and Fairfax and, and Alexandria. Yes, some of it is simply just traffic, <laughs> right? Um, and the cost of living here, um, but also just that additional workload that they end up feeling because it, um, all of this extra learning and everything that everyone wants had to happen um, after hours as well. And, um, and I remember having teachers say, look, I really appreciate it and I want to keep learning and I'm so glad that you all found the money for us to get trained in this and I really do want to get trained in that, but it's extra. I feel like I'm getting punished for wanting to go out and learn because now I also have to write lesson plans and then I don't even know if the lessons I wrote are even going to be executed depending on the substitute I get. So those were just some of the um, experiences that I had that I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. I, I, yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I think you can look at this issue from so many different perspectives. Uh, you know, what you just talked about with the retention, I, I have looked at it really more as a work, not more, but as a workforce issue. And, you know, we've undergone this salary study, and we all know that there are very few salary lanes and stuff so where we're number one, um, you know, we're a lot of times two, three. And, you know, so if someone's looking at, oh, you know, a salary is not quite where this other school division is, but I have a Wednesday afternoon or once a month that I can meet with my colleagues and talk about students go through professional development. You know, that's something that, you know, I think goes a long way. Um, the other piece that we didn't talk about is, uh, you know, for the, the secondary level. So I have a um, seventh grader and a junior. And, you know, we talk a lot with our with our uh, strategic plan about um, social and emotional well-being. And I just have to say that I think that those early release Wednesdays for that age group is huge, you know, because the ability for them to, on a nice day, walk home with their friends, just downtime, our, our junior is, is always, you know, he's a football player, he's an athlete, you know, just for him to come down and have two hours where he can just relax before he goes to football practice or what have you. So I think that's, you know, something that we haven't talked about um, that, you know, I know Dr. Dimmick will not agree with me on this, but I, I wouldn't even mind two days at, at the secondary level. Um, but, you know, I just, just to, because it just, um, watching my boys, that's just such, such a stress reliever for them. I do think that aligning the secondary with the elementary does help for those parents who have older siblings who can watch the younger ones, you know, and Ms. Silverman, you know, you and I have had many discussions. I, it is not lost on me that this is tough for parents who are both working, you know, this community centers really try to be partners and, and provided, you know, early release Wednesday um, services, but those have been hit or miss with staffing issues. Um, so, you know, I definitely get that piece too. I just, it is, it's a complicated one. Um, I do think that if we can have some alignment between that and, and those families who do have older siblings that can help watch the younger ones, 
Um, but you know, it, it, for me, it's it, I'm conflicted because I can really see it from all these different perspectives, and I I understand each of those. So, yes, Ms. Silverman. Uh, I uh, first I want to echo um, what Chair Downs just said. I, I think you made a lot of really good points, and I, I share a lot of them in terms of both the 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 nuance and the complication of this issue. It reminds me of some of the other ones we've wrestled with, where there aren't there isn't just an easy answer. Uh, and I just wanted to thank everybody because I just appreciate that this is a conversation and that we've all you know coming to the table trying to be um, open minded and. Um, and recognizing all of the all of the different facets to this, uh, it's it's yet again we're somewhere you can't you can't please everyone, um, and so we're just trying to keep our eye on the prize on what are the the, the biggest priorities here. Uh, I also uh, the liaison to the Rec and Parks uh, committee, and I know that they are they've been trying really hard to to be good partners, and like uh, Chair Down said, with the staffing issues, um, haven't been able to fully offer the programs they would like. And I know that those programs don't work for everyone. Not every family can access those programs for, for a variety of reasons. But I'm just curious, regardless of exactly what short days look like um, in the future, if we were to have some, is there anything else that we can do to sort of ensure or beef up um, the options for childcare um, for the younger kids? I do love the idea of making sure they're aligned with secondary, because I think that will help some families, not all families, but you know that's that's one piece out of many that we could do. Uh, I'm just curious if we, if there are other things on the table or out there that we can do to sort of um, be have a stronger guarantee for our families. So the daycare program provides early release coverage to families that are enrolled in the program on a regular basis. A long, long time ago, I believe they did do some type of drop-in service on Wednesday, but they too um, have not been able to hire staff who will work just one day a week. Right, and then to hire all those additional staff to cover just Wednesdays, they need to pass that cost on to the families that are there the other day a week. Right, so a long time ago, they made that tough decision that if you wanted the Wednesday coverage or coverage on the professional or the other um, non-school days that you needed to be in the program. Um, right, so I think the challenges have to do first with staff, that's definitely the highest challenge. And then the second thing we really have to think about is space. Right, so while teachers are in the building doing all these great things, right, those classrooms are in use, right, the daycare program has a substantial number of kids that are using the cafeteria, the gym, right, so we really have to think about in whatever solution that we put in place to try to make sure that that space works. Um, and we've really worked hard with park, Parks and Rec in, in terms of trying to make that happen. Um, but those are just some of the challenges that we work on in terms of um, trying to provide some additional um, childcare options for parents on Wednesdays. Right. I appreciate that. Um, I'm, and I and I understand there's only so much you can do about staffing challenges. And yes, trying to find the people that only want to work a few hours a week is is tough. Um, I just I'm, and I don't know what the solution is. I'm just wondering if while we're in creativity mode, if there's something else we can we can um, be thinking about to make sure that we have a robust offering for our families. Again, knowing that doesn't work for everyone, but it would alleviate some of the pressures for some families. Um, and then just to um, Ms. Silverman's point, I think it's important to always be looking at what surrounding jurisdictions are doing to get good ideas and to make sure that we are aware of, of what else is going on around us. Um, but I don't know that that always has to be our goalpost. Um, sometimes what other jurisdictions are doing is, is a good goal for us. And sometimes it's just fine and we can, we can be better than fine. Um, so I think that it's a, it's a point well taken, but doesn't mean that just because other jurisdictions are doing it, that it is best for us. Thank you, Ms. Tice. Dr. Dimmick. Thank you and thank you for your presentation. It was, it was very helpful. I have a few different questions. Um, the first is, are, are any of the early release Wednesdays virtual? No. Great, thank you. Um, and then second, I guess in listening to everything and sort of I, knowing um, Ms. Silverman's concerns, um, first at the, at, the, at the elementary, I, I guess I'm wondering if there's a way I like early release Wednesdays. I do think they're very useful. Everything you presented demonstrates this usefulness. Um, but I'm wondering if there's a way to streamline it a bit. I don't, it doesn't, I don't think one day a week is, one day a month sounds sufficient from the volume of, of the work you cover. But for example, in next year's schedule, there are 
four days in May, and May were at the end of the school year, there isn't, um, yes, more school happens in May, but do we need four days in May? And do we need three days in April? I guess I'm thinking, is there a way to tighten this up a bit? And then on the flip side of that, um, in hearing what the high school and middle school do, I agree with you, Chair Downs. Um, um, and I do like, my, yeah, they're, they're lovely to have early release Wednesdays. It's like a decompression for my kid. Um, it sounds like, I guess I would not be adverse to adding additional days into that schedule, especially, you know, front loading them so that they can be useful. Again, maybe in April and May they're not as useful, but adding a second day earlier on in the school year so that y you can really see the benefit from what you're doing from the planning from the it, it just it seems to me at, at the high school and middle school where you're having only the grade level like these sort of cross grade level things you do and recognizing the importance of <coughs> if we really want to own sort of meeting each kid where they are having those conversations and if the only time to have those conversations is once a month, perhaps we're not doing our due diligence for those kids. So I guess, yeah. So I guess I wonder, tighten a little on the elementary and see if the secondary actually needs another, needs more days. I, I remember, Dr. Ian, you and I had talked about this a long time ago, and I, I remember you, you had said to me that the two day a month sort of model i'm just throwing this out there you know as you know if the whole system was aligned for two days a month and one could be sort of a system-wide pd and the other one could be school-based um you know so I, I i do i do like that idea of alignment um i know we're just talking sort of out loud and just having a discussion right now but um i think those are great points too dr Dimick. is you know as the school year goes on you know the need for those early release Wednesdays in May, I'm not, I'm not sure, um, you know, at the elementary level, because as things are starting to wind down. Um, so, but <laughs> Ms. Jordan is gonna, uh, she's gonna, up. sorry, <laughs> I got it, I got it, I'm gonna take over here. Please, please, things never down. wind down. <laughs> because we're planning for next year. Our May early release Wednesdays is when we're taking all of your input for what you want for our children. So actually, um, and it's okay, I can play nice if we want to align and go down a little bit, but we do use our May. Our May already is packed for early release. That's when we're coming together and we're really having absolutely every teacher that works with every student at Oak Street uh, look at class placement, class assignment, and looking at uh, teacher, uh, teacher input, parent input, all the above. Um, but no, we never wind down. We're always planning for the following year. <laughs> no, it's a, you're, you're doing your job, Ms. Doctor. Good. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. If I can jump in, that, but that sounds to me like something that could be done after the school year, after the kids. Uh, the teachers if leave. We, if, yes, but if we were going to add. On the back. On the, okay. On, if we were going to add. I heard you say adding to the front. No, no. Add to the back. <laughs> I mean, it, if there are things that are happening that could be happening, that there's a lot that has to happen during the school year, but Absolutely. if there are things that don't have to happen during the academic year, perhaps we don't need to use the early release days for those for those activities. Yeah, we um, if if that is sort of the direction, um, we probably again since we're just talking about it, you know, we'd probably need to look at the days on the front end, how those are are utilized, and then if we're going to move those. Because it's a zero, it's sort of a zero sum game. Because if we add days to the teacher contract for more professional, for like if we had five days at the end of the school year or whatever, that does begin to get into some um, cost cost issues. So I'd prefer to to sort of try to live within the days that we have if we can. But I hear you. Yes, uh, Dr. Anderson. Thank you all for your presentation. It was very informative. Um, but I just had a, uh, a curiosity. I'm, I'm wondering why uh, the half day Wednesday schedule is actually different for secondary versus elementary. I, I, you want to answer that? I, I mean, I have. Do you mean the bell schedule or the structure of what we do? Why is there one instead of four or three? Yeah, so why is there one half day early release Wednesday a month for the secondary and essentially, you know, 
three per month for the elementary. I'm just curious. I, I don't I don't know that we know that answer. Uh, so congratulations, you stumped us tonight. Uh, let us let us do a little history uh, on that. Um, I, I will say somebody at the table might know the answer, uh, but I'd, I'd rather not spitball. So um, let us do a little little check in. Yeah, I, I was just curious because you know there's a lot of PD going on at the elementary with those yep. um, early release, and I you know, and so I, I'm just I was that's that's kind of what it, I got you. It was a uh, that's a good question. My you, former hat of a school counseling person would say it's probably a schedule driven, right? Like to hear what Tim Kasich said around how the schedules were split for the grade levels, it probably was the only time that people could come together to do any sort of grade level calibration, right? And so I, I would understand that from a curricular standpoint, why elementary might be different than secondary. And just knowing historically, I, I kind of looked at Rob like, you're 10, 11 years in, right? <laughs> do you know? <laughs> um, but I do know when the configuration of the middle school was different teaming wise, it, it could work that you still would have some departmental time be able to function because teachers taught two disciplines. So if you taught math, you taught science. And because they were off at the same team time, you had the ability to have more teachers have department time as well. So they would maybe have on a Monday grade level and then Tuesday department. But since we've now moved to teachers teaching more individualized content, that model didn't work, but that was, oof, 10, 15 years ago, and I think it was a five, seven model, and the high, the eighth grade was with the high school. So that's years, years ago, um, is my understanding. But I don't know. I think that's just so, a good guess. So, well, Hypothesis. We, we better not guess. We'll, we'll get that answer for you. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. So Newton's get getting nervous. Uh, yes, Ms. Tice. <laughs> I had a question for either Ms. Hardy or, or maybe the gentleman behind you. Um, I'm just curious, candidly, if on the short Wednesday, on the early release Wednesdays, and with the compressed schedule at the secondary campus, how do you how do you feel about the instruction on those days? Does it do you feel like sometimes the instruction suffers? Do you feel like they it's kind of a relief to have a shorter class and and they are strategic in how they use their shorter classes? I know you don't have all that many, but I'm just curious how the instruction changes up with those compressed schedules. Um, it doesn't. Um, I think that. One of the things that surprises me every day at the, at the middle school is that when the bell rings, people are teaching. And when it rings, they're still teaching. <laughs> so um, from a planning perspective, from an instructional perspective, I don't think there's a miss at all. I don't think that there is a, you know, this is a shorter day, so we're going to step back a little bit. I think it is, at least from the middle school perspective, it is, you know, all hands on deck. They, they go, uh, no matter what the day looks like, no matter what the schedule looks like. Well, they plan for the schedule. Thank you. Vice Chair Gould. Yes. Um, I, I, I do feel, uh, I, I'm glad that we're talking about this as a conversation because I think we just got to remind everyone here in the room and also hopefully gets reminded to teachers and staff and students that this is a conversation we're trying to figure out. And this is obviously something that has, um, uh, that impacts our community for both, uh, you know, good reasons and challenging reasons. But this is not a decision we're making tonight. Um, and I think uh, and I, and that's been clear from some of our conversations we've had with the community. They thought this was already decided and it is not. And we're taking time, as Dr. Noonan said, nothing's even going to change next year if anything's decided. So it'd be helpful if we could all help message that to say this is we're all trying to work through this together. The other thought I had is I, I, I do find value in having half day and full day professional development. I know when I was a teacher, those are different when I show up and there's no students all day than what I would do if we actually had a half day. So I do like this kind of balance of having those. Um, and I don't know exactly how to describe it. I'm sure you all could probably describe it better than I could, but I do like having the balance. Um, the, the, I think the question that I have though is I'm curious from a leadership perspective. And again, putting my teacher hat on is, is trying to balance the need for teachers who are excited about professional development with, with teachers who might not be as excited about professional development. How do you balance the requirement of teachers and what they have to do with all the activities that you just outlined on these Wednesdays in terms of how do you require them to be there? How do you work with that? How do you get them there? What's your what's the, the, the carrot and the stick approach that each of you use at each of your schools? Because there is a concern and I'll say there's a concern about how much engagement there is. And you know, and when you have staff leaving and you can see that staff leaving, then are they doing all the things? How are they doing all those things when you see a significant number of staff leaving? That's what I've heard from the from some of the, the parents, and that's a concern. 
Thanks. I mean, I think, you know, this question might be addressed differently at different levels. However, I know at the middle school, um, because that is their only department time, that, they're, that everyone stays on campus, that these are departments that meet in groups of sometimes as small as four um, or five. And so if somebody is missing from a CT within that department, then that's a it's a big void. Um, and so I know, you know, from from the middle school perspective that these are almost required because of the collaboration standpoint you know, within a department. Um, and so I don't think there really needs to be a carrot um, just because they need to do this work and they know it and it is their time during the month to do this work. Um, so that's from the middle school perspective. But, but I think that is, uh, that is the carrot though. You know, having been in other divisions and having seen when it's not meaningful PD, what can happen? Uh, I think that everybody has acknowledged that this isn't like to Rob's point, it's needed and the parking lot doesn't lie. Uh, you know, as you know, we don't have a lot of space, we can tell, uh, but the, it's still, it's still full uh, on those days. And sometimes I, this is just me. I'm not sure if it's true, but it seems like they stay longer uh, on some of those PD days when they're actually getting to do some of the good work. I would also offer, um, Dr. Gould, to your point around the half day versus the full day. I think we've done a lot of digging to try to figure out what the PD need is. And so for us, it has been um, a lot of the sit and get and the content delivery around IB. Our IB team has had to rethink around how we engage the teachers to share out more of the best practices from within and creating then that, you know, you mentioned this earlier too, creating that scaffold of here's the, here's the menu. Now you pick what's right for you because it's all going to meet the goal, right? So, and all of it's going to be something that will help you with your practice. And then to that, go back, reflect and, and spend the time unpacking it because now you have the time and where does this fit in your lesson? And so it's not as much of us sitting and giving them every single minute of instruction by us. It's giving them the nugget that they know they need and then the time to thoughtfully collaborate and talk with a colleague about how they can implement it or the colleague that just demonstrated it for them, right? So it's trying to meet them where they are and giving them what they need so that they find value. Because I do think that had been a miss prior to. There was a lot of us talking at and not necessarily giving them time to do and give them what they said they needed. So I do think that we've gotten better at that because I know what you're talking about, right? Oh, we're, no one's really watching. Can we leave at 2.30 or 2.00, right? And to, instead, to now shifting it to, we are having meaningful conversations and I'm actually making improvements in my unit plan. So I want to stay and finish it because I can get something done and actually check it off of my list. Um, but to your point about half day versus full day, I, I fully agree. It is a completely different mindset when we know a teacher can come in and they know at 1210, yep, we're going to feed you and we are starting to Rob's point. We don't have much time. So we're starting at 1210, 1215. We're starting lunch. Let's go. They are coming and it's like boom, boom, boom versus when we send staff to a full day PD that is led by the CIA team, it is a very different headspace. You're going into a thinking reflective space, usually off campus. And I do think people come back and you immediately see the uplift. So I think there is a, a mental difference between I got a short amount of time, I got to focus, get it done to this is my space to think and create and really um, implement and, and breathe. They're two different zones. So I do think you're right. Um, it's, and it's nice to see both when our teachers get an opportunity. And I think even for us as leaders, when we get an opportunity to have PDs um, that look like that. I really can only echo uh, what she just said. It's uh, trying to have a balance of choice um, so that teachers are engaged because they get to select what they'd like to um, get busy learning and take turns doing it um, because they can't do it all at once, even if they want to. Um, and as far as leaving, I have to be honest, I, I have not seen staff doing that. If anything, if anyone does want to have to step out, they'll come and say, Cream, I just want to let you know I'm actually going over to MEH or Meridian or Mount Daniel because we're going to collaborate about this. Um, and then the other times, if there has been any emptying of any spaces, it's been those times that um, our staff has gone to uh, Mount Daniel or Mount Daniel has come to Oak Street. So that look could look a little deceiving if all of a sudden you see the parking lot empty, but it's because it's filling up somewhere else. Um, but, but I haven't seen that issue at Oak Street.
At Jesse Thackeray Preschool, if you do see our parking lot empty, our teachers are out in the community conducting home visits and they go as a as a teaching pair, as the teacher and the paraprofessional together. And sometimes home visits can last 30 minutes, sometimes they can last an hour, depending upon the needs of the student. And it's really driven by the teacher and the parent and the paraprofessional and the child that's there as well. And students love showing their teacher and their paraprofessional around their home and their play space that they have. So then the teacher and the paraprofessional can see, okay, if I have a student and they're interested in something at home, how can I incorporate that into the classroom and that's best met through having a home visit so if our parking lot is empty tomorrow afternoon our teachers are out in the community conducting home <coughs> visits and bringing back very data learning their students and incorporating that into play-based instruction in the classroom thank you all very much any other questions or comments no Okay, well, thank you um, everyone for being with us this evening. Thank you for the presentation um, to all the principals, Mr. Bates, Ms. Michael. And again, this is just a first discussion of several I'm sure we'll be having. And as Vice Chair uh, Gould said, we're, you know, we're just discussing right now and uh, we'll probably be revisiting this in the fall. Um, but thank you again, especially to the principals for joining us this evening. And I know it's been a long day for you all. So thank you. So I'm going to send them home. Yes. So, but but bye. tomorrow's the system-wide early release, so that's good. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> the Downs boys are already excited. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Thank you again. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, section 2.02, .02, the Walls Fall, uh, West Falls Church Project Easements. And I'm going to actually um, let Ms. Benson take it right over, and we hope that this will be a quick item. Yes, sir. Good evening. And I am going to hand it over to Caroline Crawford, one of our partners at Hoffman Development. She has um, graciously joined us tonight and um, sat through that great presentation. Um, there are um, two easements that the economic development site needs from the school board, both relate to traffic lights at the high school campus and um, we have an image that shows where those lights would be and a few other things but um, thank you for your time Caroline welcome and um, at this point would direct questions um, to her although certainly I'm happy to try to dive in as well hi everyone um, I'm I'm back with on the topic of easements um, so I'll just provide a little bit of an overview and then if you have more questions I can see what we can answer tonight and if they're highly specific legal questions then we'll I'll get back to you so um, again obviously you know this project well um, and where the school is in relation um, as part of this project we're installing four new traffic signals so there are two that are in the city of Falls Church and those are on the north side of the page on Haycock Road so at Mustang Alley and um, what's called Street C there will be eventually called Magnolia Street. So it'll be a mid-block crossing. The other two lights are in Virginia Department of Transportation, VDOT jurisdiction, and those are on the south side of the page on Leesburg Pike. So the reason that we're coming to you with two easements is because the easements need to be made to two different entities. So the ones on the south side of the page and the larger circular areas um, need to be granted to VDOT. And the ones on the north side of the page need to be granted to the city of Falls Church. Both of those jurisdictions, of course, will be, we, we will be installing them and um, paying for the construction, but they will be ultimately maintaining them. Um, I think the easements both read with language like they can come in and, you know, cut away any vegetation or overgrowth that's, that's near signals. So um, if you don't mind going to the third page, um, actually, um, then we'll come back to the second page for a moment. So one of the things I wanted to share with this group, and uh, you might have already seen this last year, is the area in that pinkish color is in parcel C2, and that's fully owned by um, Falls Church Public Schools. And as you can see, it kind of wraps the site almost completely like a donut. And so I wanted to draw your attention to that's basically, that's why we're here um, requesting the easements. Um, so I think in, sometimes in other jurisdictions, these signals are in fully um, public streets, but because of the way just the configuration of the property is here, um, that's the area in the red is the city of Falls Church property. And so um, that's the group that will need to grant portions of these easements. Portions, the, portions of these easements are also in the white area, that 
parcel D2 that's in the that's in the center, um, and that's on our site. So we wouldn't need you all to grant easements there. That'd be for the the site to grant. Um, and then the second page, if you don't mind going back, sorry. Real quick, just yeah. jumping in. The area in pink on the third side is all owned by the school board, not by the city. I'm so sorry. That's I, all right. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we have them surrounded. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, definitely owned by the school board. Um, and I'm afraid this is a little hard to see, I guess, so um, I'll describe it, but um, there's some line work in pink and it shows the easement area. It's the geometry that the civil engineers have provided. So the, again, the ones on the south side are for VDOT and that's per VDOT standards. And then the ones that are on Haycock, the northern part of Haycock Road are to be granted to the city of Falls Church. Um, there's a couple different colors here and that was prepared by the land use attorneys because um, there are a few different types of easements and dedications that run through the school board's property. Um, I think the punch, not I think, the punchline is that they ultimately require is an easement, but I just wanted to, that's why there's some different colors there to make sense of which areas of reservation or easements are where. So I know this isn't a voting session, but I just wanted to provide an opportunity to answer any questions. Any questions from anyone? Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Thank you very much. And I, you might have just said this, and I, I, I just didn't process it well enough. So the, the yellow that says perpetual street easement, mm -hmm. um, is, would that be, is that us signing off that they can have that and do whatever they want with that space and so anything can happen with a sidewalk and anything can happen with plantings and so i think that's a apologies that's a little misleading that's not the easement area that's what already exists there today and i think that's to the local jurisdiction um yeah i think that's right so the easements that are at um that will be before the board at the board meeting next or the beginning of next month are those ones on page one the first page if you don't mind scrolling up mr brett um just where the circles are where yeah. the traffic um yeah. lights will be yeah 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 i have some hard copies if anyone's interested where it's easier to see the the pink areas but. Well, I just wanted to point out as a school board member, I need to point out that one of these documents, the word school is misspelled. So um, <laughs> yes. it's, the well, deed, <laughs> it's the deed of easement that was prepared by the attorneys. Uh, the um, one that deeds to the city. Yep. Yes. Line one. Yeah. I didn't have to be David Ortiz on this one. I could just basically, it's <laughs> in bold, school is misspelled. So. And we have sent this to outside counsel, and I did hear back from him late this afternoon. So there might be a few tweaks to the okay. before we bring it to the board. That is definitely on the top of my list. Thank you. Questions? Any? Oh yes, sorry, Vice Chair Gold. This is probably for more, Ms. Minson. Can you just explain for us the, um, like the legality of the school board granting an easement for traffic lights? It seems like that's more in the road, and how does that relate to school board? I just don't know. It's just 101. And, and I might pass this over um, to Carolyn. I believe that the base of the traffic light is on our property. So we are uh, granting the right to install that base and then maintain around it. So if there was to be vegetation or any overgrowth, if they had to do any maintenance, they would be able to be on our land to then access the base of the light. Okay. But the light itself that goes over top would be over a street easement that has already been dedicated or isn't even our land when it comes to Route 7 Leesburg Pike. So just the location of the base of the um, the traffic signal is on our property. That makes sense. That makes sense. And and obviously with all the construction, there's been a concern about safety and, ch and children moving in and out and walking. Um, and maybe this is for, for you in terms of like, or, or I don't know who's going to answer this, but the planning around that, around the safety and the walkability, yeah. how does that get addressed or how do we get reassurance from a community that that's going to happen? I mean, I think these in the big picture, right? Maybe we start there these lights are, I think, going to go a very long way in making some serious pedestrian safety improvements. Um, so 
I think the latest that we heard about the light timing is that we're anticipating they can be installed. We have to get these easements, of course, and um, but that they would, could be installed and operational in October. Um, um, the one, I think key one would be on Mustang Alley. So those are the ones that we were asking about specifically. I can't speak to the timing on the Southern ones right now. Um, so those are ones that we know are really, really important um, to, to the school. We work with Kristen um, and her and her colleagues quite a bit. We have a every other week meeting and we talk probably too often for Kristen's liking, um, but we, you know, school safety and student safety is obviously the, the top priority. Yeah. I think one of the advantages in terms of these lights is is right now the only existing light is at Haycock and, and Broad or Route 7 at that corner. And that's a pretty big intersection. And regretfully, people right now go through that intersection and they go pretty fast in kind of both directions, whether they're on Route 7 or whether they're on Haycock. So we're really hopeful that by putting these additional lights in, I know many people have pointed out this is a lot of lights in a small space, but we're really hoping that these lights help to slow down traffic. And particularly for that light that's on um, Commons Drive, right? There's kind of that hill there, right? One of the challenges yeah. right now is when people are headed westbound on um, Route 7 and they go through the light at Haycock, they kind of go pretty fast, even though that's a slower speed zone, right? Hopefully when the development is in place and that additional light, it's going to, to feel um, like a much slower speed zone and that light at the top of the hill. Um, we're, we're really hoping will improve visibility for people turning into Mustang Alley and then people turning out of Mustang Alley. So that, that should help us. Um, we're super hopeful. And then on Haycock, that mid-block um, stoplight there um, will help kids that are going over to the giant parking lot as well, right? Obviously, there is a light at Falls Church Drive, even farther up Haycock, um, but kids like to take the shortest walking route possible. So that mid-block light at Magnolia, which is now Street C, is something that we're also super hopeful about. Yeah, and I, and I do know a number of parents drop off their kids in giant just to make it easier. So that's a great... Uh, place for the light. Thanks. Appreciate it. Dr. Ortiz. Yeah, uh, th th thanks. Thanks. Um, I think the, the easements look fine. I'm not, you know, I don't have a, I, mean, I, I didn't catch, I was looking at the pictures and not the words. <laughs> um, one thing I'd like, um, who does like the light, the, you know, the timing study and the traffic flow study? Is the, does the city do that? Um, so it's a it's something that gets approved, um, but it is prepared by traffic engineers. Mm -hmm. um, there's a firm called Grossly that does a lot of the traffic engineering in the area, and they've been involved with the project since 2019. So okay. that has to go through approvals with VDOT um, and the city. Okay, if, I think if it's okay with the, the chair, we can think about it as these get installed. But it would be, you know, currently and even before the construction, all other stuff, traffic was kind of disastrous over there. You know, it it. Period. I do know enough about traffic engineering to know that that lights and controls can paradoxically improve traffic flow. But I'd like to hear from the traffic engineers about you know what you know what they're trying to accomplish in terms of the traffic flow, both in terms of safety as well as in terms of trying to just move move yeah. vehicles. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. I do agree with you, Ms. Michael. That one, it, it's a, you can't even make a right out of Mustang Alley because that traffic is coming up that hill by the McDonald's so fast, it's, you can't even, it's hard to even get out and make a right out of there. So I think that would be great to have another light there. Yes, Ms. Tice. Uh, to that point, is that, is this the final, are these the final number of lights for this development? So there won't be one out at Mustang Alley and Route 7? Correct. So we'll, there, you'll never be able to turn left? Correct. Okay. But In, in but, fact, there's gonna be a barrier there. So you won't even be able to, to cross the way it's designed ultimately. And then people who wish to, to who wish to turn left and may be doing so illegally now, um, in the future, they'll have the ability to drive through this development as well, right, to get back into the city. So we should see um, tremendous improvements in terms of traffic flow um, with the additional streets. We're hopeful. And they could go to the light at Commons if they wanted to turn out. Got it. Okay. Right, yeah. because oh, oh, I was just, so yeah, there, there are definitely people turning left on a regular basis. Right. So that's great. I'm but sure, right, I knew you'd have thought of it. I just didn't know what the. Bottom that would. Was. I'm assuming that that would be alleviated once we can, because we can't go the other way down Mustang Alley, right? To Haycock, we have to only go out that way. So we are. 
We are super, super hopeful that we'll have two-way traffic um, back on Mustang Alley when school starts in the fall, right? They will have reconfigured Mustang Alley from Haycock to the new portion. It'll be one way only at arrival and dismissal, right? Because the buses come in and block the full road. Um, but we're, we're really looking forward to having that street in its finished condition with two-way traffic and having that light at Haycock, which should make a huge difference um, to both cars and pedestrian safety. Yeah. It's especially difficult when there are big events at the high school. It's a nightmare. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other comments or questions? Well, thank you so much, and thank you for sitting through the early release presentation. I, I know I that you were on the edge of your seat with that one, I'm sure. But <laughs> um, but thank you. And and uh, we and again, if anyone has any questions um, between Kristen and Trish, just um, you know they can help us with the questions and relay them to city staff and get get our answers so thank you very much thank you for coming this evening yep thank you so john before we start the next item i'm wondering if you can make this bigger even if we have to kind of scroll up and down because I think that'll it'll be more important that people can see this. Thank you. Okay, we are at 2.03 compensation study discussion, and I will turn it over to Dr. Noon. Yes, uh, thank you. This is sort of a placeholder on the agenda in case there were some questions that came up since the presentation um, of the compensation study. And, and as of today, we did receive uh, two questions from Jared. Uh, Anderson and one from Laura Downs um, and we can certainly answer those and then if there are others that the board has we can we can answer those as well um, but we just put it on there just in case you had some questions so um, I, uh, Ms. Michael do you want to take the um, the questions that we received yes I would be absolutely happy to um, so at a really high level some of the questions that we received um, from Dr. Anderson and Chair Downs were related to teacher salary increases, right? And when we looked at the presentation from Siegel, they gave us kind of global percentage increases for salaries. And they gave them to us on the teacher salary scale by each of the different lanes and then in total. So the first question that we received is when we looked at that total salary increase, how did we account for teachers um, who were already over market? So when we look at the salary study implementation, Siegel's goal was to bring market consistent or market relevant pay to all of our employees. So we've been really consistent in terms of as we implement this, people further from the market will receive a larger increase, right? People whose salaries were over market would receive a smaller increase, but no one would see a decrease in pay. So when we implemented these um, salary scales, when you look at the teacher salary scales, um, I'm going to go through this chart in just a minute and walk it through, but we'll be able to see where each employee is in terms of their lane and their step and what those increases are. So my hope is, is that we'll answer those questions um, as, as we go through the chart. Um, so on this chart, on the very left, um, what we're showing is the BA salary scale lane. Um, you can see going down, this is for next year, what steps people were, will be at. Um, so because this is for next year, we haven't hired anyone yet for next year. You can see on every one of these charts, there's no step one right now, right? And that just means as we were costing the salary study, we haven't yet hired anyone who will be on step one for next year. Um, so when we look at this, we do have an employee who would move to step two. In fact, there are two of them on the BA lane. Right, and their percentage increase for next year would be 8%, right? And that's based on that market relevant pay. So when we think of all the graphs in the compensation study, just to kind of highlight, our salary scales generally at the very beginning of the salary scale were on market on step one, but our salary structure had freezes or hold steps for the first three years. So all of our teacher salaries dipped below market, typically right after the opening salary. And then they were below market until mid-career. And at mid-career, our salaries were over market. And then they dipped back below at the end. So when we look at the bachelor's degree lanes, you can see all of those different salary increases for people based on step. And on the bachelor's degree lane, right, the lowest salary increase there, someone on step 10 at 2.8%. Um, but all of those other salary increases are um, higher than that average of teachers, um, which was 4.69%. 
So the second chart um, is the BA plus 18 lane. Um, you'll see the steps that people would be at for next year. Um, on that lane, the lowest increase that you see is step 17, and that's 1%. And if you remember, we have our lanes capped at the bachelor's and the bachelor's plus 18. So at the bachelor's degree level 12 is the highest step that we have, right? And then teacher salaries remain flat after that. And then on the BA plus 18, the top salary step is step 17. So those people that are on step 17 are people um, that are, were either already at the top of the salary scale, and we had a number of people there, or anyone who was moving to that step. So those 17 people next year, based on the scale implementation, would receive an increase of 1%. And then um, included in our budget for the last couple of years has been anyone at the top of the salary scale also receives a $1,000 bonus that we've typically given out in November. So each year when we do the budget process, um, we include some type of salary increase in the budget um, that we're hoping to get. But in each year, the salary adjustments that we adopt in the end often vary from what was proposed in the beginning, right? Sometimes they've went up and then other times they've went down. I mean, if we think back to COVID, you know, we were really thinking we'd have a really great budget. And in fact, nobody got any salary increase at all, for example. Um, so typically, by the time we get from proposed budget to the end, there's some type of an adjustment. The third chart in the middle of this page is a master's degree lane. Again, you can see in this chart that the people that are at the lower steps, where we've had free steps in the past, are getting a higher percentage increase versus when you get down to the middle of the salary scale around step 17, highlighted in yellow, those are the employees that are getting less than a 2% increase in terms of their pay. And that's because when we look at those employees, they were over market previously. Right now, we ensured no one would see a decrease in pay. Um, but in this case, you can see there are, um, on that scale, 32 people um, that are receiving an increase that's less than 2%. Um, you'll see something similar on the master's plus 30 lane. Again, you can see mid-career where we were over market. Um, those are the employees that are receiving that lower increase. Now they've benefited from having much higher increases in previous years. And the people that were under market, again, you can see at the very beginning of the salary scale and the end are getting those larger increases. And then something similar on the PhD lane. So what I included in the far right is a chart that really kind of breaks down for our employees um, where they're ending up. So on the teacher salary scale at um, 2% or less, we have 52 employees and that's 20% of the total teachers um, on these salary scales. Employees that are getting somewhere between a two and a 5% increase, there are 99 of them and that's 38%. Then when you look at our employees that are getting a greater than a 5% increase on the teacher scale, there are 99% of 99 people there, which is another 38%. And then those people that have been capped on the BA plus 18 lane, um, there are nine people there. So overall, that accounts for all of the 259 teachers on the teacher salary scale. So my hope is that kind of answers how we calculated those averages and gives people an idea of where they're at. We said when we started this that our employees that were farthest from market would receive a higher increase than those that were over market. And I think one of the great things in this compensation study is we did make that commitment that no one would lose pay, um, as had happened in the past um, when they did the teacher salary scale adjustment. And then when that um, scale adjustment was done, we also hadn't looked at any um, positions other than teachers. Um, so that's the other kind of difference in this salary study. Okay, I have a very dumb question. There are no dumb questions. Um, so this, this is um, so. If you're looking at this, they're still they're still going to receive a cola, right? So we included the cola. The, the cola we included the dollar value from the cola. Okay. And the dollar value from the step, and the dollars we kind of set aside for the compensation study into this implementation. Okay. One of the things we looked at for all of the people over market is if we just applied a COLA on top of that, we would be moving even further out of the market and we would kind of be exacerbating that problem and actually making it even harder to adjust when we fully implemented the scales. Okay, so this is everything. This is everything. Cooked in, okay. Correct. So everything I see before me, is that that 1.04 number, million dollar number that was in last time, last Correct, okay. correct. What I did is I took um, from the chart that Siegel had where they had the 
percentage increases. I just went ahead and, and pivoted out to get how many people were at each step, basically breaking the data out. So people who had questions about, you know, how many teachers at what level and how did we do that average, right? For anyone who was set to lose pay, in some cases they did receive more than one step, right? To ensure that their pay remained positive um, when we implemented the new salary scale. Thank you. Um, Dr. Anderson, does this answer your questions or you have follow-up questions? Yeah, no, that, this is exactly, like, I, I didn't even say, I didn't even, you, you read my mind? That was fantastic. <laughs> um, no, I, the, the, the reason why I asked the question, and I, and I know that everybody is very uh, cognizant of, you know, kind of, you know, we all, we all want to invest in our, in our people and, and the, the new salary scales make so much more sense than the old ones. Um, but I know that, you know, with that, people are still going to get less than less than what they would have gotten in a cola from the uh, orig original pros budget. And I, and I know that all budgets go through go through changes, and so um, so I was just curious as to kind of what that what that is. And you know, it, it is just kind of um, you know, I just wanted to I do want to publicly express concern that you know, like given the amount of inflation over the past year, given that uh, you know, who knows who knows what's going to happen in in the in this next year. Um, you know, having ha having having staff get less than a two percent raise is just you know, you know, I, you can say that they were over market to begin with, but it's still that that was their salary, and now it's going to be much less than I think what most people would say would be even like you know, kind of a minimum minimum preferred raise. So, but I I, under, I understand yeah. the difficulty no, of you know, implementing that. I appreciate your yeah. comments, and I think I think we 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 knew that that was going to be a risk going in that there were going to be some people that were going to not get as much as others because they'd been really either close to market or even over market, and um, and inevitably that's what happens when we do compensation studies. The the silver lining for those people that are in yellow here is if you if you remember sort of the the graphical wave. Um, it, it, yeah, the, the money does come later in the scale, and if they stay with us, they'll end up making more than they would have in the old scale. Um, and so, uh, although that's a harder pill to swallow because it, it is sort of deferred gratification, um, there there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel. But I, I think we do, we, we hear you. Uh, one of the... Um this neighbor that when I uh, sent you a question, um, this is a discussion I had at the bus stop. Uh, he had asked me a question about um, looking at the masters and the masters plus 30 and how they, the proposed salary skills are all keeping us above market, right? And so um, the assumption there is that so that we're remaining competitive because that's the bulk of our teachers. Is that a correct assumption? That is a correct assumption. And while we are above market, we're still not in the number right. one Right, we're still like, I think, third in, in a lot of those ranks. Okay. And remember the compression there. You right. might be off by $300 or $400 between one and three. Right. Or three and six for that right. matter. Yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, and I, I just put this out there. I think he thought, you know, if in that presentation, we talked about trying to strive for 95 to 105 of the market and that the bulk of our teachers are in that master's, master's plus 30. So really the bulk of our teachers are above market. I think, is that fair? I, I think it will be in this. Well, as, that's yeah. what I mean, once yes. this is implemented. That's right. Okay, yeah. okay. And then that's not to say bad or good, it's just, I think, you know, just semantics and all that. And uh, yes, Ms. Silverman. Um, piggybacking, first of all, Dr. Anderson, I knew you would love this chart at the second I saw it, and I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I looking at? <laughs> um, very different brains here. Um, piggybacking, piggybacking off of what you were just discussing, talking about, um, and I'm just, again, being creative and just trying to think out loud here. Is there a, for, for those getting, you know, less than 2% or 3%, is there a way to stretch out the compensation study implementation so it's not such a hard hit on the first year? Um, I, I think there's always the possibility of doing that. I think the, the issue is that um, we're talking about 54 employees that are getting less than a 2% raise in, uh, in an organization with 500 employees and our support staff are getting somewhere between 13% um, to bring them to market and you can see the percentages with the lower numbers. 
So I, I would be very cautious about slowing anything down because what would our justification for, you know, the 90% of the organization that's actually getting getting more than more than the 2% and in some cases getting double digits to bring them up to, to market. So I, I, again, I think, um, I think it's a short term pain uh, for a, a longer term gain, even for those people that are getting less than 2% because in two years, they'll be getting more than they would have gotten Explain. In, the old, in the old system. Like if you look at steps, we can go back and do the analysis, but if you're a, a master's plus 30 at step 17 and right now you're getting a 1% cost of living adjustment, I, I think it'd be interesting to look at if you were in the old system, where would you be at step 19 with a master's plus 30 versus where you would be in the new scale at a master's plus 19? Because I think the differential there ultimately over time is going to is going to pay off. So, <coughs> so I wouldn't slow it down. Okay, and that that makes that makes sense. I, I'm on board with that. But in like two years, their regular cola will be larger than one percent. Is what you're saying? We'll, we'll have to go back and do the analysis. But we could we could look at in the old system if we didn't implement it now, what would it look like for in two years, five years, seven years for that employee in in one of those yellow lanes? versus if we implement it now, what, what would it look like at two years, five years, and seven years? And my suspicion is, based on the salary scales that I've seen, over the next several years, they're gonna be making more in the new scale than they would have in the old scale. Okay, I hope that's correct. Um, if I can, just one more question. Good. On the BA and the BA plus 18, um, <laughs> first, what, what's the under 12, underline 12 in the BA it has a 7.3%, who is that? Not not which individual, but like, there's no step there. Um, sorry, and th and that's solely because of Excel and its weird pivot format. That that's actually two separate people, and the twelve just should be repeated below. But Excel doesn't automatically repeat the number. So if you jump over to the master's degree lane where you see step two seven point eight, and the next line it's blank and it says seven point eight, that's also two. It only puts the next step where the next number is. Okay, that makes so, sense. Sorry. No, no, that that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then, secondly, I, I understand the um, the interest at capping BA and BA plus eighteen at twelve and seventeen respectively. Do we know where other jurisdiction late neighboring jurisdictions cap their BA and BA plus eighteen? Go ahead. I don't. Maryland used to have a law about a required cap at certain levels, but I don't off the top of my head know what surrounding jurisdictions do. What I would say is our percentage of employees on the BA plus BA 18 lane are each under 7%, right? So with our great tuition reimbursement programs, our waivers for UVA and Virginia Tech, we do provide a lot of support to our employees to try to get them to the master's degree lane. Um, one of the things where we're really unique, and I think it's a huge benefit, is if you're a step 12 on the BA lane and you um, get your 18 credits, we're gonna continue to keep you on step 12. So some jurisdictions give you like an increase of in pay of like a thousand or $2,000 and then put you on a lower step, but we maintain your step. So as you continue to get more education, it's truly financially a huge benefit to you um, as you're moving across those lanes and our employees have taken great advantage of that. Yeah, I just I still come back to those employees that may have barriers to to furthering education, and when does experience count um, to a higher level? And so, um, I, I hate to put work on your team, but if it, it is possible, just to find out, you know, maybe we're Fairfax, Fairfax and Arlington where they're BA and BA plus eighteen. Yeah, we, um, could, we can talk capped. with Siegel and find out where they cap them. That would be great. I, I do think it's important for us to continue to incentivize our teachers to keep learning since we're a learning organization. And that's that's the way, and, but I do understand that they're, and hopefully in that 12 year span, um, whatever is the barrier, we can help our employees overcome. Yep, okay, thank you. Vice Chair Gould. Yeah, I, I, I would say that uh, any compensation study is always going to be very difficult because uh, you know you're going to find who is who is paid, who is valued, and it's very difficult. I really appreciate the transparency that you all have provided for this. I know it's hard to 
provide this kind of transparency, knowing that I think as, as Dr. Anderson pointed out, sometimes people are going to realize where they're at. Um, but I, I appreciate all the effort for this, um, and I'm fully supportive of how you all have put this together and what you're recommending. So that's what I'd like to. Thank you, Vice Chair Gould. Yes, Ms. Tice. Uh, yes, thank you for all of this. It makes perfect sense to me, and I've heard nothing but great feedback from the community. Um, so I think people are really excited about the um, the improvements. I'm curious about the non-teachers. Um, that's um, you know almost half of the employees, right? Um, and I'm just curious if there are parallels similar to the to the um, yellow on that on the chart on this great chart up here. Are there similar employees in that position on the non-teacher side that are getting kind of really small improvements? I believe there are just a few. It might even just be two. That would be under a 2% or something? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that's because the non-teacher staffs were mostly all below market. Correct. Right. Correct. Right. So I know that, and, and I think that's fantastic. I'm thrilled that that's where, that's where the bulk, uh, you know, a lot of the energy is going um, and the dollars are going. Um, to make up for that. I just wanted to make sure there weren't employees on that side because it would be an even an even bitter pill to swallow <laughs> to wait that out. <coughs> That's a great question, Ms. Tice. Anyone else? Right, well, thank you, Ms. Michael, and I'm, I'm sure Ms. Kopik had her hand in this too, so please thank her for us. This is a great, you know when Dr. Anderson is excited about a chart that you've done a good job. So, <laughs> so thank you very much, it was very helpful. Okay, and now we're going to move on to 2.04 superintendent, superintendent's presentation of goals review. Great, thank you. Um, I'm hoping that this will go relatively smoothly and, and quickly, um, but I did want to um, kind of review with the board. Uh, this is typically the time of year that we start to talk about sort of how are things going with respect to our, our goals. And um, I wanted to take a, a minute just to share with you kind of where I am. Um, with some things I've been working on uh, and, and as we move forward. So let me start by just building a little bit of background knowledge for you um, because some of you were on the board, some of you weren't. Um, two years ago when I worked with the school board as part of my own professional learning, um, I had um, asked and we discussed um, the possibility of doing a 360 uh, degree feedback tool and um, over the course of that year, I was able to connect with the Center for Creative Leadership, which is out of Greensboro, North Carolina, um, to engage in a 360 degree feedback tool and instrument um, that I gave to about 15 people throughout the organization uh, from top to bottom and got some really great feedback. And subsequent to that, um, that session, I also had an opportunity then to interview a number of feedback coaches that I would um, ultimately then work with uh, post, um, post that opportunity, and um, I met uh, with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Ed Betoff, who uh, is in uh, just, just outside of Philadelphia, who is, uh, I selected to be my coach, who led me through a really, I think, meaningful feedback session um, around that 360-degree instrument. And from there, um, I uh, was able to um, have a conference with uh, Dr. Betoff and also Chair Downs. Um, to do what we called an alignment conference because when I did the 360 degree feedback, um, he asked me to develop sort of an executive plan based on some of the feedback that was there that would be useful to um, the school division and I did and so I uh, shared it with Chair Downs. Uh, we did the feedback session. I took their feedback and incorporated it into um, a lot of the work that I've been able to do and after those um, goals were shared, um, I did send it in a news note a long time ago uh, to the board and uh, I've also now met with uh, Dr. Betoff um, six times throughout the year to sort of check in with him and talk to him about the progress of some of these goals. Um, so just in terms of the um, overarching drivers for me going into um, these, these three goals that I've been working on, and I did share this with the leadership team and with others uh, in the organization, um, there, were, there were some things that were sort of non-negotiable for me. The first was it needed to align to the strategic plan um, really directly, these goals did. Um, I wanted to engage employees at each and every level. Um, I wanted to help build capacity of our team and ultimately grow the bench of leadership in the city of Falls Church. And part of that comes from, um, you know, our desire to really raise our own leaders here. 
uh, and we haven't necessarily had an opportunity to do that in the last several decades. And um, so being able to work with, uh, with leaders in a different way has been really important to me. And then also continuing to build a strong relationship uh, with, our, with our workforce. So when um, I did get the feedback uh, from uh, that 360 degree, there were competencies that were overarching um, in, that, in that tool. And then in, within each of those competencies, there were strands. Um, and like, um, like many of you who've been a three, through a 360 degree tool, uh, depending on where you are age and stage wise with respect to your uh, leadership, um, uh, you know, one of the things you, you can do is you can look at where your deficits are, you can look at areas to improve, or you can look at the strengths and sort of lead from those strengths. Um, and because we were um, working with, because I was working with Ed uh, Betoff, Dr. Betoff, um, sort of, you know, when do you fix a roof when it's not raining outside? Um, things have been going pretty swimmingly here for uh, other than the, the last couple of years because of COVID, but um, felt like it was a good opportunity for me to sort of dig in a little bit around where some of the strengths are. Um, so the competency, uh, one of the competencies is inspiring commitment. And, and essentially that's how do you bring employees into um, developing commitment to the organization. And so one of the, um, then all, uh, underneath that strands is understanding what motivates people. And motivation's an interesting conceptual framework just to, to look at both internally, extrinsically and in, intrinsically. Um, there's a lot of research out there um, associated with, um, with, with motivation that I've been looking at as part of my work. Um, but one of the things I was really interested in is what motivates our staff, right? And so um, I had this as a goal and that was by the end of the school year, I would study, analyze and communi communicate what motivates staff at all levels via these focus groups. Um, and also what gets them to perform at their peak. Um, and then I wanted to baseline also the perception uh, that our staff felt they had capacity to do what they're doing or to be able to do more um, within their job, um, job strands and then identify ways to motivate others to do some work um, or to work to their full potential. The, the strategic alignment plan um, obviously goes uh, right to our investing in our people. And so some of the strategies that I put in place um, was first to develop a short survey instrument um, that I uh, utilized with our staff in some small groups. Um, I engaged with those focus groups that were um, completely uh, um, randomized through our HR system. I did ask Amy Hall to pull out 50 random people from our system. Um, and from there, I've been able to have uh, now four out of five meetings with 10 people each. Um, and, and the way that it, I set it up was to do it through cross-functional groups. So we had custodians and food service workers along with teachers and administrators um, all in the same room. Um, I, I did ask them the same questions uh, in this survey format and then um, am reviewing some of the data collected. At this point, I haven't had my last meeting. Um, it's scheduled for May. Um, but once I do have that last meeting, I will um, take the data that I've collected, review that, sort of do a thematic analysis, if you will, of it um, and share back with the participants first, what are some of the themes that came up? And then ultimately I'd like to write a white paper that we can utilize here in the system to talk about motivation and kind of what gets people going and do people have capacity to do more? Um, so be on the, on the lookout for that. Um, and and I, I do believe that that will be part of some of our work going forward, um, making sure that all of our employees are engaged. Um, here are the focus group meetings that I've held January 30th, February 8th, March 22nd, the 19th of April, and then the last one is May 17th. Um, and they've been really, they've been really great. Um, the staff that have been there have been really open and honest and candid with me. Obviously one of the, the pieces of noise in, in any study, you know, when you're operating in your own organization is um, the superintendent, right? So how, how honest and open are they going to be? Um, I'm really clear with the group before we get started um, that, you know, the ground rules for engagement are what's said here stays here. No personal attribution for anybody. Uh, all I'm looking for are themes and I don't ask any real follow up questions. I just sort of ask the questions. And then I, I do want to thank Molly Narberg. She's been my, uh, our scribe. She's been coming and sort of taking notes. And then Amy Hall has been there as well to sort of listen as from an HR perspective. Um, but ultimately, these are essentially in-service interviews um, that, that haven't been done previously. And so I ask people these questions, you know, what's the best part of your job? 
What's one thing you'd change about your job and why? Are you doing work that you're passionate about in your current job? Are you free to explore new ideas and create new ways of doing things? What motivates you to keep coming to work for FCCPS and what demotivates you from coming? Um, what percentage of your time do you spend at work doing what you're excited about or like doing? Uh, do you have the capacity to do more if it was something you were really excited about? On a scale from one to 10, one being totally unhappy and 10 being happy at work, where would you rate, your rate yourself? And then what's one thing FCCPS could do to motivate employees more? And uh, again, from those questions, I will then do sort of a thematic analysis, but there is some early findings and I just thought I'd share a couple of things that have come up. Um, staff are happy. <clears throat> um, you know, when we get this uh, completely randomized sample of people, and, and I'm talking to custodians and food service workers and teachers and administrators, and they're saying to me on average, they're between an eight and a 10. Um, I, think, I think people are really, really happy. And, and the good news is coming through these um, meetings. Um, people really feel like they have the autonomy. And I think part of the reason that they're motivated is because they do have flexibility and agency in their work um, and autonomy, particularly in the teaching ranks to write their own curriculum and then uh, choose the pedagogical approach that they feel most comfortable with. And, and often it's associated with the approaches in teaching and learning that are part of the International Baccalaureate Program. Um, most everybody has said they're really passionate about what they're doing. Um, and, and it's really been heartening to hear the stories of uh, folks that are employees that you wouldn't expect would be completely happy and passionate about what they're doing, but they are. Um, and it's, and it's, really, it's really fun. They're motivated by our students and particularly the collegial relationships that they have. Um, but what they're demotivated by is uh, meetings that aren't needed, extra paperwork. Um, nothing that's nothing surprising here, by the way. Uh, mean or unkind colleagues um, and then some student behaviors. And one of the things that um, we've talked a lot about just sort of not in response to this, but in some response to other questions that we've um, sort of kicked around as a leadership team is um, you, you do hear stories of people feeling um, invisible um, in the system, and it's, it's a very unfortunate circumstance, but it's real. Um, a lot of our support employees do feel like they're not valued by the, the campus that they're on or the place that they are to the extent that they feel ignored, um, they feel invisible, they feel devalued. Um, and that is something that's come through in these conversations pretty clearly. So um, one of the things that we've already started to talk about as a senior staff is, you know, what are we, what are we going to do next year to sort of center on, um, you know, the, the engine under the hood? We center on the talent a lot, which are our teachers in the classroom, but I don't know that we center our work necessarily on the people that sort of make the car go, right? Our bus drivers, our food service workers, our custodial staff, our technology people, our daycare workers and the like. And I think what's happening with the salary and compensation study is a good start <coughs> and money is a, a nice extrinsic reward for our staff, but I don't know that it totally motivates people um, with respect to feeling seen. Um, and so it, it's been good feedback. Um, and they would change the volume of workload. I, I think what I've heard to a person is um, they, they are at capacity um, and, and can't do another thing. But if they were to um, reorganize or take some things off their plate, they would, they would be excited about doing some things that they're really passionate, other things that they're really passionate about. So the second goal um, is developing and empowering. That was the competency and the strand was developing staff through constructive feedback and encouragement. Um, and this is one that I, I've really been excited about um, and that, it, well, I'm excited about all of them, but by the end of the 22-23 school year, holding feedback sessions based on plans derived from self-evaluation leadership tools um, that came from Kuzis and Posner's leadership inventory with senior leadership and also engaged school-based administrators, division directors to engage in feedback sessions as well with senior leadership. And this is aligned to our investing in our people. Um, so. So um, let, me, let me just kind of tell you what we did. Um, and I'm probably not going to tell a really good story here um, just because I'm not sure how my storytelling is at this point uh, in the night. But um, one of the things that I was really committed to was, again, sort of that growing of the bench. And one of the things that I, I've learned over the last couple of years as you know, we've tried to elevate and um, really support leaders in our schools from within, that and, and even director level people and even coordinator level people, 
don't always have a background in leadership. They might be, they might have a background in curriculum and instruction. They might have a background in teaching, but leadership's a whole different animal when you're, when you're dealing with people and supervising and the like. And so one of the things that I felt like was really important was that we had a common framework by which we could kind of hang our leadership skills on. So I selected the leadership challenge by Kuzis and Posner. It's a, a, a two researchers that have, um, you know, done studies of, of major, um, you know, not only school systems, major corporations to look at those um, strategies or those big ideas in terms of leadership that really have traditionally been successful and helped leaders be successful. As part of that, there are instruments that I was able to provide to each of our leaders that became 360 degree feedback instruments as well. So they could identify within this tool where they saw themselves within each of these through a, um, about a 30 question, 30 item um, assessment. Uh, and then they gave the instrument to somewhere between seven and 15 other people to provide feedback around those same questions. And ultimately what the leaders got back was, here's how you see yourself, here's how others see you. And they categorized them by direct report, supervisor, um, uh, co colleague, et cetera, or, or same per same line, et cetera. And so you could see, am I, am I making an impact leadership wise with my boss? Am I making a leadership impact with those that I'm supervising? And then am I making a leadership um, impact with those that are on the same line as me? Um, <clears throat> and we've been able to, to work through those, uh, through that consistent tool. <coughs> Excuse me. Because the groups um, were planned, because I had planned to serve in the neighborhood of 60, 60 to 70 people in the organization, <coughs> the idea at first was I'll just do them all at the same time. Um, but they're all doing, you know, between seven and 15 feedback instruments with those that are in the system. And suddenly it occurred to me that that's not a good idea because, like, if I do it with eight people that report to William. He's going to have to do eight surveys and then there's survey fatigue. And anyway, long story short is I've broken into four cohorts. Um, so I've been able to do two cohorts so far. Um, cohort one, meeting one is going through those five leadership strands from Kuzis and Posner and talking about what it looks like. And then meeting two is providing um, the, the feedback <coughs> um, packet essentially that takes the data from the instrument and and gives a really clear um, analysis of where uh, you see your leadership where others see you and then ways that you can grow in your leadership and ultimately i'll meet with the leadership team um, to talk about how it's going with their um, each each of them have um, executive uh, plans that came from that so our next cohorts will start in october and uh, January, October, December, January, and March of next year. And so we'll be able to get through the vast majority of leaders. Um, just for the good of the order, these are the, th these are the five leadership practices that the Cousins and Posner have identified. Um, and again, it's been revalidated about seven times through their um, multiple studies, but you know, each of these have different strands within them. So there's modeling the way, inspiring a shared vision, challenging the process, enabling others to act, and encouraging the heart. Um, and again, having a framework for our leaders to be able to talk about their own leadership was really important to me, as opposed to a catch as catch can. So now we can talk about how are you modeling the way, how are you inspiring that shared vision, and what are you doing actually to encourage the heart of others? Uh, and, it, and it makes sense because now there's common language. So the planning tool that I gave to them um, to utilize is similar to mine, um, where they would look at a, their leadership practice. So let's say it was modeling the way. And then the competency might be around providing meaningful feedback that motivates uh, an employee to do better. That might be one of the competencies under um, enabling others to act or even encouraging the heart. And then <clears throat> each leader will write a goal statement, um, develop a strategic plan alignment focus, so it's investing in our people, and then talk about different strategies that they'll use to support the work. And each of, each of our leaders have three different goals. So there's goal one, goal two, and goal three. And then lastly, um, encouraging direct open discussions about important issues was under the competency of communicating effectively. And this at the end of last year, um, I wanted to really kind of revision what community outreach and engagement might look like with our teachers, our staff, our students, and our parents. 
and this goes directly to communications and engagement. Um, so these were some of the strategies that I put in place and uh, you can read them. Um, but there are a couple in here that I wasn't able to get to um, yet. And so, for example, assembling a superintendent's roundtable, that was going to be a group of students that I was going to have as sort of a, a collective that would sort of um, also do some informing. While I haven't been able to do the superintendent's roundtable, I will tell you that I've eaten lunch in a number of the cafeterias across the division um, <clears throat> and taken a lot of informal feedback. Um, and, and that is the last one at, at the bottom. Um, but looking for collective feedback from stakeholders, engaging uh, leaders to join me in triangulating messages, acting based on the needs of feedback of all of our constituents. And that's a challenge because we're always trying to balance between what teachers uh, desire, what students desire, what staff desire, what parents desire. Um, and, and our best work that we can put together is taking all of that feedback and, and, and always centering on students and making sure that it's all about what's best for students uh, in the process. So some progress towards goals, just some things up here I, I thought I'd share. Um, you know, I, obviously we did the communications audit that was presented to the school board and thank you, John Brett, for that. Uh, gave us some really good feedback from the community about our communications and uh, there were recommendations that were made that are now being planned for. Um, I have five, uh, I've had five of those staff meeting focus groups that I mentioned before. I started a superintendent's forum. Um, we've met two times, October, January. We're going to meet one more time before school lets out and maybe once in the summer. Um, and this group of people are, um, there's about nine or 10 of us that come to the room that represent all levels of the organization as well. And we talk about just generally what's working and what isn't. Um, so it's an opportunity not to meet and confer because that's something you do more formally with the FCCEA, but hearing from other employees that um, may, ha may have a different experience um, and, and kind of what's going on with them. Um, I have held office hours. I think everybody knows you all have two um, and you've got the list there of where they are. Um, I did, we did have a little scheduling glitch with the last time at Borek, but um, got to meet with the people that got, came to see me at Borek anyway which is good, and the last one will be May 2nd at Don Frady Park. Uh, in addition to that, uh, other engagements include SAOs that I meet with once a month, um, Peak, Seek, and AEEC, um, which we meet with um, routinely, Peak and Seek, and AEEC as needed. Um, I attend PTA meetings, events, uh, different events, city council meetings, and the like. Um, so lots of things going on with respect to um, communications and community outreach. So, so my next steps in terms of some of these um, pieces of information that I've, I've put together for tonight, um, you know, I, I definitely want to take some time um, over this, the summer to think about what worked and what didn't work and are there things that one could be revised, could be changed, could be abandoned, uh, even where, you know, it just didn't work. Um, we had something that we tried earlier this year that didn't work and we strategically abandoned it. And I don't think that's a bad thing um, to, to move away from things that aren't working. Um, but I also want to seek new ways to connect with people inside and outside the organization. Um, you know, it's, I, I just came back from the Virginia Association of School Superintendents, and one of the things that I, I think I'm most proud of uh, about the work that I do here in the City of Falls Church is that I can walk into a school and I know um, about 95% of the teachers' names, and I know probably half of the kids' names. Um, and there's not another superintendent that I've been able to talk to that can that does that. And it's just it's not because it's like anything special. It's just because we're small and we get a chance to be relational. Um, and so I really feel super connected to our schools and with our kids. Um, and so how do we continue to grow that outside the organization? I do want to complete that white paper indicating the findings from our focus groups, uh, complete the next two cohorts, and then con continue to strive to support those drivers that I indicated earlier in the presentation to making sure that the work we do is, is really focused and aligned um, to make sure that we keep our eye on um, the most important things that are happening in the system. So anyway, I wanted to give that to you as an as a, uh, update tonight. Um, I, was, I did not post it in advance um, because I, I wasn't sure who the audience was going to be ultimately, um, but I thought it was probably best for everybody to hear, including the staff and the community. But uh, that's where I am and uh, looking forward to continuing the work. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or uh, any thoughts you have. Thank you very much, Dr. Noon. I know I, I speak for uh, Dr. Dimmick. We were on the board when we talked about that 360. So it's great to see this all. I'll have to send it to 
Shannon Litton and Greg <laughs> and have them take a look. But it, it's terrific. Oh, maybe they're watching. <laughs> yeah, maybe, I don't think they're watching. <laughs> That's why they're not in the school room. They want to go to bed. But um, no, I, I think it is really uh, just gratifying to see all, you know, because we had talked about it, you know, in, in generally a couple of years ago and then COVID hit and all that. And so it's just, um, I find it fascinating, terrific uh, that you've taken such time and effort. I know it's been, you, superintendent is a crazy job and I know it's a lot of work and to find the time to really make progress on these goals is really kudos to you. So thank you very much for that. Yes, Ms. Silverman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Noonan. And um, thank you for really leaning in on this project. And it, it was actually, we also discussed it last year um, as a as something um, that we would, we're encouraging you to do. And I'm happy to see that it's been implemented. Um, one question I had, um, you had said that the focus groups were completely randomized and that there were um, five different meetings with 10 different people. So that's, you met with 50 separate people. Is that correct? correct? Okay. How, I'm just curious how the focus groups were formed. Like, was there a hat and you pulled out paper? Like how, how were people chosen for these focus groups? Uh, I'd have to ask Amy Hall. Okay. How, how she's, it was just a random, I think she went like every, 37th person or something. Okay, which is also random. Yeah. Just as random as yeah. pulling a paper yeah. out of a hat. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yes, Vice Chair Gould. There was a slide you had about the five <coughs> principles of the, um, the mm -hmm. leadership model. There was one about challenge the process. Yeah. Um, I, I clearly connect with that one. Um, <laughs> can you talk about how that fits into the leadership framework that you discussed? Just sure. a little bit, unpack that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's one that, it's interesting um, when I, <laughs> when I, um, in my second session, when I'm giving feedback give, and giving the tool to the leaders, um, I have them come de come in, and I've got the five leadership strands at different tables, and I ask them to self-identify where do you think your highest strength was that came out, and inevitably people sort of sit across all of the different um, areas, and then when you actually give them their feedback, where they end up is really interesting. And the first group um, was uh, uh, I took the first group because it was the, our highest level leader. So the number of people at the table here, some of our principals, et cetera. And there were quite a few people that ended up not sitting at challenging the process, but ended up at challenging the process. Um, and then in the next one, which was sort of our next level of, of leaders down, um, there was uh, no one, and I'm trying to remember exactly how it went. There were two people at challenging the process, um, but everybody, identified themselves as encouraging the heart and 90% of the people in the room were enabling others to act. And it's sort of like, why is that? And uh, anyway, so we, we unpacked that a little bit, but challenging the process to, to unpack that in the simplest form means, um, in, in my opinion or my estimation, it's because we've always done it this way is not the right answer. Like we, we've got to continue to challenge ourselves to look at the processes that we have in place and refine them and tweak them for our current situation, our current context, and the work that we have going forward from now until the future. So think about some of the things that you all have asked us to sort of engage in, whether it's the new school calendar, you know, you definitely challenge the process on the school calendar. You, we, we challenge the process with the compensation study. Um, you know, those kinds of things that have, that become status quo um, and, and I don't want to be in an organization where we're sliding. I want to be in an organization where we're really looking at and, and digging under issues that are there and challenging those and, and doing it in a way that um, is not confrontational, but instead is, is really about um, sort of figuring out together and collectively and, and in new ways, um, moving, moving ahead, looking at things differently. Hate your guy right there. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you, Dr. Newman. We really, and I know just Absolutely. putting together this presentation was very time consuming. So, but I think it, I can speak for the board when I said it was really uh, informative and really brought us up to speed, you know, in terms, I'm obviously, I knew a little bit of this because I had sat in on that meeting um, with you um, and Mr. Betoff, as I said, Betoff. Um, so I knew a little bit of this, um, but that that was, you know, that was also sort of COVID time and all that. So it's nice to see how much progress you've made. And thank you again for sharing that with us. Of course. Thanks. Okay. I think we're going to wrap up.
Um, if there's any, does anyone other have any other questions or comments before we close out for the evening? Um, and thank you to all the staff who stayed with us another late night. We really appreciate it. And uh, Dr. Noonan, again, thank you for your presentation and we're adjourned. <laughs>